make a small plan, big plan, medium plan, but you have to start planning to reach the goal. And that planning, if you add action to it, it will make your dream come true. What you do this year, today, is to find out the universities, the opportunities that you have out there, explore it, and see if it matches with the dreams. And start working on the plan. Make a small and don't plan, forget big to plan, the action. Medium I wish plan, yeah, all but of you have to start come planning to reach the goal. I have faith and that, that all planning, of you if you add successful action to it, your field, it will make the best dreams come true. What you do this year, today, is to find out the universities, the opportunities that you have out there, explore it, and see if it matches with the dreams. And start working on the plan. Make a small don't plan, get big to plan. the action. Medium I wish plan. Yes, all of you have to start planning. Wish and I have faith. And that all planning, you if you add action to it, it, feel. it will make all the best dreams. come true. What you do this year, today, is to find out universities, opportunities that you have out there, explore it, and see if it matches with the dreams. And start working on the plan. Make a small don't plan, get big to the action. I wish plan, yes, all of you have to start planning as the I have faith and that all planning of you have access and access to it or feel it will make the best you. come true. What you do this year today is to find out the perfect opportunities that you have out there, explore it and see if it matches with the dream. And start working on the plan. Make a small plan and get big to my action. Medium I wish plan, yes, all of you have to start planning as the I Recording in progress. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, BBS Education Fair 2022. Uh, we are focused on our webinar, Careers in the Post-Pandemic. Uh, that was just a short video. A uh, welcome message from our ASD representative, Ms. Juliana, and also um, just a little bit of a preview of the different universities that have joined up in the education fair for BBS this year. Um, with us today, we have two guests. We're experiencing a few little technical difficulties on the new webinar platform that we're using. Um, Mr. Richard Sutejo. Uh, he's from I3L a School of Management, and he's the headmaster in biomanagement. Uh, Richard, would you be able to camera on and say hello? Yes, hello, Nick. Unfortunately, I have received the message. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. I received this warning, so I cannot open my video. Try that. Uh, try now, Richard. We've changed your status. Yes, now I can there open up. Are. Yes. Okay. And um, we'll try to find Andrew in the participant list to bring Andrew in. And we also have, he's in the participant list right now, we have uh, Mr. Andrew Lo Kim Kuhn, Senior Director in the Office of Admissions for Singapore Management University. And we're trying to bring them into the panel and speed right now. Uh, audience, please bear with us. Uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties. And there we have, we have, move to webinar.
Okay. Hello. It's okay. Thank you. Again, um, just working out the technical bugs here. Yeah. Uh, so here with me, uh, I have Richard, who just introduced himself, and Mr. Andrew uh, Lo Kim Kuhn, again from Singapore Management University. We've we've now figured out how to get you as as a main panelist. Um, right. Thank you. So maybe uh, let's start. Uh, Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, then Richard, introduce yourself, and we can move on to some of the topics for the day. Sure, sure. So yeah, uh, morning everyone. Um, my name is Andrew. I'm from the Office of Admission and uh, Financial Assistance at uh, Singapore Management University. Uh, yeah, very glad to be here. So what what we have today at SMU is, I think, is 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 a is a, is a very innovative um, uh, things that we we are going to introduce uh, maybe to the panel today. You know, one thing is that uh, you know we. It, it, in this part of the world and many, many areas, right? Uh, we are talking about things like interdisciplinary, things like, uh, you know, uh, holistic uh, discipline and all these things. So at today, what we are trying to achieve is uh, maybe to introduce to you some of the new, the latest uh, innovative disciplines or you can call it curriculums that is uh, happening at, at SMU, where, you know, we, we, we what we're trying to do is we, we're going to, Put our students and equip them with the the skills that is very important for 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 times like this, right? So we are looking at places where you know things are happening very rapidly, and uh, you know uh, apart of apart from that, we are looking at you know uh, you know digitalizations, sustainability issues, you know. Uh, so these are things that uh, at SMU we are we are trying to be in the forefront of this. Uh, this uh, in the industry, right? So happy to talk about this uh, later on. Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent uh, for the thank you for the introduction, Andrew and uh, Richard. If you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit about I3L, um, sure. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nick. So. Uh, a very warm morning, everyone. So my name is Dr. Richard Sudejo. So my background is actually science. I am biomedicine in background. I have also bioinformatics. So I come in I3L as a head of department of uh, head of muscle and biomanagement. So basically I3L stands for International Institute for Indonesia International Institute for Life Sciences. So I3L is the institute that specializes in life science. So we have biomedicine, biotechnology, food science and nutrition, food technology, pharmacy, uh, bioentrepreneurship. We also have the ISB. ISB is the I3L School of Business. We have um, international um, management, we have the uh, bioentrepreneurship, and we also have a um, master in biomanagement. So our school are strong in uh, all of the bio-based um, study program. And we also uh, learn the interdisciplinary, um, like with um, healthcare, with biotechnology, with pharmaceutical, and with food and agriculture, and also with biotechnology. Yes, that's about, that's about all. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Richard. Sorry, I, I, I neglected to say the doctor first time. And uh, when you work yeah, that hard fine. to get a PhD, you deserve, <laughs> the, you deserve that title. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, that. yeah, that's okay. Sorry, okay. <laughs> um, awesome. So we have uh, uh, two uh, very well-respected people in the field. We're representing here Indonesia, I, I3L in Jakarta, and of course, uh, one of our students' favorite destinations, which is Singapore. Everyone loves to go to Singapore. And I am <laughs> I graduated from Singapore as well. I graduated from NTU. Oh, excellent. Nice. Yes. We have, a, we have a lot of students who love uh, going to Singapore and who love to choose to study there afterwards. Mm -hmm. So uh, happy to have uh, these countries represented. Um, so just for the students to let you guys know the format, um, we're going to hear a little bit from each speaker on you know, their thoughts and feelings about how things have changed with the 
business world or you know in the post university world and also within the universities maybe how things are being taught what classes are offered they'll prepare they have a few uh, a few talking points prepared uh, but we're also very open to questions i think a good webinar uh, gives the, the audience the information that they want and need so uh, we do have a moderator please feel free to use the q and a function audience and uh, anything you would like to know about on new careers, new programs, changes in the world due to the pandemic, uh, please put those questions in and we will spend a significant amount of time fielding those afterwards. Um, all right, let's just go back in order. So uh, 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 while you're thinking of your questions, let's listen to our panelists go a little bit more in depth, uh, Mr. Andrew. Do you have any like? Uh, do you have any slides prepared, or just you want to speak from? Sure. How uh, how long do you want me to talk about this? Uh, you know, I have a slide yeah. on SMU where we can talk about SMU. Yes. Uh, you know, at, starting with a little late, so it's eight twenty. Right. I would say like 10, 10 to fifteen minutes maximum. Sure. Sure. Ten minutes would be perfect. Sure. And if you need to share, yeah, okay, so you can do that was gonna work. Excellent. Right, so this is actually a very nice picture of uh, SMU. We are actually in the heart of the city, right? So, uh, you know, uh, as, at SMU, we, we like to say that, you know, uh, you know, day and night, I think you, you, you get to see very different scenery of the, of the campus. So my name is Andrew. Yeah, I'm from the Office of Admission and Financial Assistance. So what we do is uh, we, we, we really look into all your application, you know, and then apart from that, you know, uh, you look at, you know, the scholarships to be given out, especially to, you know, we have some scholarship that is actually meant for Indonesian students only, uh, you know, from, from, the, from the very generous donors who are, you know, some of those uh, big Indonesian corporations. So what they want is they, they would like to people good quality students to study at SMU and in future, you know, uh, benefit from it. And then after that, you know, what they, what they do want is, you know, to, to have a career with them. That, that's how, how it goes, right? So very quickly, we are in the heart of the city, very nice uh, location. Uh, we, there are actually three very important things that we have at SMU that is uh, made compulsory. One, we, one of which is uh, internship, right? So every student would have to go through at least 10 weeks of internship, but many of our students will do at least two to five internship before they graduate, right? So compulsory internship before they graduate. Why? Because we want to have that placement, a good placement for students. So internship is the one that is really successfully placed students out in the different uh, industries that they want to get into. So as, as SMU, we are part of the city, financial district, it's just one stop away the Raffles uh, MRT station. Uh, we have actually blessed with uh, five MRT stations around our campus, two of which are actually just beneath our campus, right? So if you've been to Singapore, uh, the Bras Basa MRT station and the Bankulan MRT station are all situated beneath our campus. So as we speak, you know, uh, you know there are trains running across the campus. Right, so uh, what makes SMU difference is that we have very flexible interdisciplinary core curriculum. Means to say all the students, regardless of the degree programs that they are doing at SMU, they are expected to uh, finish at least eight to 12 modules of this that is uh, not related to their discipline, right? So unrelated to their discipline, because what we want is to have a interdisciplinary type of learning, a broader based learning where students are expected to learn something else, not just within the scope of the, the discipline, right? Uh, why is it so? Because companies, the industries um, expect our graduates to not just know the, their main domain, but something else, right? So uh, for students who are looking at, uh, you know, uh, studying a domain or a discipline, you know, Sometimes it's good to be exposed to other disciplines because 
as, as we speak, you know, the world is changing, right? So we are in this world called the VUCA world, right? Vulnerable, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. So we need our students to be entrenched in not just in their own discipline, but skill in the rest as well. Uh, the other thing that we have at SMU is 100% small class size. Uh, we do not have lecture theatres. So what we do is we implement from day one when S SMU was established in the year 2000. So we have run uh, classes that is just maximum class size of 45, 45 people per module, right? So uh, in order to get a, uh, a degree, you need to satisfy about 40 to 42 different modules. So each module that you go to will be about 45 people in that class. And they are not the people who, who follow you in the different module. So it's modular system, very different uh, from uh, a traditional university where you go in with uh, 300 people in a lecture. So we don't do lecture, we do seminal style, uh, style right? What's the difference? The sem difference is seminal style means the notes are actually given to you a week or two to make some preparation, to read on it, to do some research. And we, when you come to class, it's about discussion, it's about learning the concept and the application, how you apply, right? So that, that's, that's what we want to achieve. You need to know how to apply the theories that are given to you, right? So it's not about going to a lecture where you take notes. So that's, that's the traditional approach. So at SMU, that's not the one that we are looking at. So it is seminar style. The other one that is guaranteed is uh, at SMU is, and it is compulsory is a global exposure program. That means every student, even though you are an international student in Singapore, we still want you to step out of Singapore and go and do an exposure program. So can it, it can be an exchange program with another university partner, or it can be a study mission, and it can be a community service project overseas. So what we want is we want our students to have that mindset the, that you understand the different culture, different ways of doing things, you know. And these are skills that is important when you start working or when you start your own career, right? The other thing about SMU is we guarantee you a second major. So every student, regardless of what degree program they do, they are able to do a second major that is out of the degree program that is not related, right? So they can do something related or they can do something not related, right? So take, for example, you, can, you, you may want to do a degree in accountancy, right? And you can do a second major in political science. It's up to you to choose. So at SMU, we give that freedom for you to choose a second major. In fact, a degree that you choose at SMU is also not based on a subject that you're do doing right now, right? So there isn't any subject prerequisite at SMU. So I uh, mentioned earlier, one or more internship that we are doing. So our students will do at least two to five, most of our. So what they want is they will test themselves out in different fields, different industry with the degree program. So maybe it's something that they, they, you know, certain place they may not like to, but they, you know, so this is something that we want them to have that field, the internship. And internship is the portion that actually secures them the job, right? We have a very strong career service center so every student would have a career coach for them right so someone who are uh, experienced in that area to guide them along right so for that four years you not only looking into your academic uh, mentor you have your career coaches as, as well at SMU right apart from that yeah community service is, in, uh, is a one comp compulsory element that you have to fulfill uh, it's about 80 hours, but most of our students do at least 120 hours on average, right? They can be doing it in local, in Singapore, or they can do it overseas. So these are some of the degree choices. We have uh, launched a few things uh, recently because of the changes of the industry and of the demand, right? Uh, so traditional approach, you can do things like accountancy, business, law, social science, Politics, Law and Economics, which, is, uh, which was launched about six years ago. So this important combination, you know, were expected of graduates from some of the big companies like 
from the consulting companies, right? So they like graduates who have that three important components, politics, law, and economics. So this form a very important things for them, the backbone of, of any industry, right? The economics, if you are looking at things like econs, we have launched computer science apart from information system. Uh, we have launched computing and law, which is also a very innovative degree program because in the industry, right? Uh, you know, the IT or the technology component, the, the industry are looking for people who not only know about computing, but the legal aspect. Same with the legal uh, industry. The law companies are looking for graduates who not only know about law, but the computing aspect. So these are important skills to have. At, right? Then we have launched software engineering. And then recently, three years, three months ago, sorry, we have launched a seventh school called the College of Integrative Studies. So College of Integrative Studies, okay, uh, this is actually uh, a snapshot of the majors that are being offered at SMU, right? So uh, you can take a look at the, the, the website, but because of the essence of time, I will not uh, dwell too much into this, right? Uh, so these are things that you can look at. So one thing about us is that there isn't any subject prerequisite at SMU, right? So you can be a science student, you can be a, a humanities student or a commerce student, you are able to take any degree program. So uh, for example, if you can, if you, you want to take computer science, but you are worried that you are, you don't have that coding or programming knowledge, you know, it, it doesn't matter because in, in university, before you come, you know, or before you start a, a class, there are workshops, coding workshops, programming workshops that will be given to you, right? So one thing about computer science or about economics for students who are looking at this portion, uh, one thing that uh, that area that you need to focus on would be that you need to understand that computer science and economics, they are highly quantitative, right? So what they do is uh, you need to have a stronger foundation in mathematics, right? So apart from that, you can choose most other degree programs or whatever degree program that you fancy. We have launched a College of Integrative Studies uh, three months ago. Uh, so to make sense of what you learn as a student. Some students may think that, okay, I do not want to go into the traditional approach of learning accountancy, or I do not want to do business uh, just doing communication management, or I do not want to do uh, computer science. I want to do something that is very different. I want to really customize my own degree program because I, I know what career I'm going in, heading, right? So College of Integrative Studies was launched three months ago to make sure that we are in the forefront of this uh, in, in, the, in, in the industry where you know, students actually get to customize the degree that they want, right? Because maybe, for example, they want to go into sustainability or growth in Asia, right? But there isn't a degree program that helps them. So at this College of Integrative Studies, you will be assigned a faculty and work with you along the road of getting this, a Bachelor of Integrative Studies, where you learn things and you try to make it more interdisciplinary, right? So a interdisciplinary, integrative approach to having a more uh, a, a, a concise degree program, right? Apart from that, uh, at SMU, we expose our students to three different pillars. As I mentioned earlier, you need to do about eight to 12 modules based on this core curriculum, so capabilities, communities, civilizations. So a student from law degree program, a student from political science, a student from business, they would be exposed to all this part of this, uh, the basket of this, uh, this uh, modules, right? So you choose some of this module to take uh, because I you know we, we want you to satisfy, you know, that's why we are known as Singapore Management University. So that portion, that management portion, that, that foundation that we want to build on, right? So things like, there are a few interesting uh, causes like, you know, managing in a VUCA context, managing causes uh, for students who wants to, you know, study maybe social science and they don't have exposed to technology. And there's one module that they need to do on technology, on, on sizes, on all this. 
So in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is we want our students to not just go deep into a subject matter, but broad as well, right? So these are things that we, we want our students to be, right? So very deep and very broad with a possibility. So you will complete your degree program typically in a four-year program, right? Four year your so this is uh, a very nice picture of our seminar classes. So we, again, I mentioned earlier, there isn't a lecture theaters that we have at SMU. We have all seminar style classes like this, right? So what we do is seminar style where notes are given to you, you read on it, you come in, and there is discussion, there's group project, and there's presentation. So what we are building on students is every, every day when they come to seminar classes is to build on their soft skills, communication skills, ability to work in a group, ability to present. So these are important soft skills to have, you know, uh, when you start work or when you launch a career, right? So these are things that we want our students to do, important soft skills, right? So Global Exposure Program, uh, you can take a look at our website and uh, we have more than 220 different university partners. You can go to Europe, you can go Asia, North America. So it, essentially, exchange is the most uh, popular amongst our students. So what they do is they go and exchange uh, in a term, uh, maybe do three modules in one of the university partners that we have. So these three modules are taken as part of your graduation requirement. But these three modules that you do, the grades do is just for pass or fail, right? So, you, so one thing is we do not want our students to be stressed up on getting their GPA. So that's why we just offer a pass or fail option for exchange program. The other thing that is advantage of going exchange is you don't have to pay the tuition fee to the exchange partner. So tuition fees are already paid to SMU. You go for an exchange. So uh, and then after that, you get to understand the different things that, 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 that comes with the, the destination, the country that you have then exchanged, right? Surf and lead, there's community service project, right? We are ranked as well, so uh, we won't get much into detail on this, but uh, you know, SMU, one thing about us is uh, we are very particular about this rather than the ranking. Employment outcome. This is very important because we want our students to be Employed and not just good employment, but high starting pay as well, right? So these are actually done, this survey is actually done by uh, the Ministry of Education in Singapore. So they will do a graduate employment survey for each batch. So uh, NUS, NTU, SMU. So what they do is they'll, they'll do this uh, survey and then they'll publish this every year, right? So this was uh, last year's batch. So 96.2% of our students graduated and uh, got the job six months before uh, their final exams, right? So we, 96.2 is actually ranked amongst the highest, amongst the local university, amongst NUS, amongst N NTU, right? And our students get the highest starting pay, right? So one thing that we want and we actually confirm is employers like students who have that soft skills, right? the communication skills, the presentation skills, the ability to work in a group, right? And the initiative, able to take initiative. So these are important skills that you guys should be building on, right? So we have a lot of workshop in SMU where we make sure that our students are actually, you know, are well prepared, well equipped to look for a job, right? And of course, the career coach will be the one guiding them along for networking session, right? So learning on jobs, uh, as, as we speak, you know, some of the degree programs that we have, we are actually introducing things like work study option, where you work and study at the same time, right? So certain modules that you study, you, you get to practice it while you study. And so that's, that's the work study option, right? Uh, we have a few things, a vibrant community. So we have a large, Indonesian population here at SMU, and they have this cultural club called the SMUKI, S-M-U-K-I, which stands for SMU Communitas Indonesia, right? So what they do is they, they like to come in together, 
as Indonesian and then try to promote the arts and culture of Indonesia to the rest of the student cohort. Right? We have a boarding at SMU, so we call it the Princep Street Residence. Very nice area. And uh, one thing about coming to a public university like SMU, NUS, NTU, is that uh, students will be Andrew? able to... Yes. Uh, sorry, sorry to cut it here. Uh, we're past the 15 minutes. I do want to give some time sure, to I3L. Sure. Um, sorry to cut you off there, but for in terms of pricing structures, you can pass uh, your contact information. We okay. can give it to students, so if anyone has pricing... No problem. Questions, I'll, they I'll can get back now. to you. After, okay. I want to get on to the post-pandemic focus a little bit more. So I appreciate right. that. Thank you so much for sharing on uh, on SMU. Beautiful looking campus. And uh, I think the students learned a lot about what's offered sure. there. Um, excellent. So uh, Richard, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about I3L and how it looks at careers in the post-pandemic, that would be great. Oh, okay. So, okay, let me share my screen. Yeah, so um, I believe um, the time given is uh, five to 10 minutes. Am I correct? Okay, so let me uh, go through on the presentation about the uh, career development uh, post maybe. Yeah, so since we are in the life science school, I'll speak a little bit, yeah, uh, more focus on the life science. You know, as we know that we have been hit by um, COVID-19. Uh, yeah, I mean, 10 minutes, 10 minutes will be fine. Yes. Okay. So, okay. I'll continue. So, um, since we all know that everyone has been hit by um, pandemic since 2020, and now it looks like um, it has been um, diminishing and we are returning back to the normal life. But, right, um, from the pandemic itself, like we learned about um, various issues that we will experience what we call it disruption. So, um, pandemics causes us to change our way of um, doing things, how um, we have certain areas on demand and certain areas which needs to be upgraded, right? So we will refer this as disruption. So what type of disruption? So um, since this is directly connected to human health, let us discuss about the healthcare system, right? So now, um, we have been experiencing some of the deadly strains, right? Like a Delta, Delta, right? Alpha, um, Beta, Delta, yeah, among those deadly strains. And now they are um, the one they are most currently circulating is the Omicron, Omicron strain, right? Which are fortunately less contagious. But not only that, right? We are also yeah, having another disease that's coming, like um, monkeypox. Right, monkeypox is uh, more towards um, blood based and uh, macro droplets. So it is not uh, the pandemic potential of monkeypox is not as big as COVID, of course. Right, but now if you hear like people are are paying attention again to the tomato flu, if you have heard that before, right. So since we have this, we call it post pandemic trauma. So people are very wary about you know like a new. We call it emer emerging and re-emerging infectious disease. So people are paying attention, right? So when people are paying attention, of course we have the higher demands of those people who can keep watch of this, right? And then right, if certain diseases can become worse, of course we need to prepare the infrastructure and the healthcare facilities to support, right? At least the pandemic will not be as bad as how it were during the COVID period. Right, and then also we need to educate. We need to send um, uh, information in a unified way, and then in the national and global scale. Right, so we need to, we have demands of this group of new um, capabilities, new skills, and um, new knowledge. How we are going to assess this, and then in production, of course, I mean like. Of course, um, I cannot be you know listing out many in details, so I focus on the life science. So people are more um health aware, right? For for now, and then people are looking for the you know the immune booster. People are 
now are more aware about vaccination. People know about the prevention of medicine, and people would like to know like how to do a easier access to healthcare system, right? So this is the production. And then if you see that, you know, like if you have a large gathering of people and you have the pandemic, of course it will be a hit, right? It will be a hit and the production will be halted. Now people are considering how to automate things and use as least, yeah, least human labor as possible. We need to switch to a certain automation system that are pandemic proof, basically. Now, how are we going to do that, right? So this is the disruption. People are thinking differently. Like currently we are speaking in this platform like Zoom, right? We are also have this disruption also, right? So we are connected even faster than before, right? Now, yeah, of course, now the traveling restriction now it has been lifted, right? Transport and tourism now has been lifted. Of course, this is no longer relevant. But if you look at the condition now, like a mall and shopping center, that people find the convenience of e-commerce now, Right. Okay. E-commerce. So the um, um the the offline and face-to-face -face retailing, like traditional, like what people have done in the past, may not be very relevant now. Now people are looking, um, browsing through, you know, like a many of the online platforms like Tokopedia, Shopee, TikTok, um, Instagram, right? So, um, there are more and more demands. Uh, uh, for these people, how to create contents, how to create uh, many of these um, stuff. But of course, here I would like to focus on uh, life science uh, because uh, I treat is life science, and I am I myself has a, a strong life science background. So the shifting trends in the career planning. So what, what a type of shifting plan, right? So if you think about how your parents um thinks about um uh healthcare, people think okay. I will become like a doctor, a doctor, a doctor, but it is way larger than that, right? So the medical diagnostic, for example, like many people are rushing to, to do the, the antigen test, to do PCR test. Yeah. So this, this is like medical diagnostic, right? And then also people are um, pushing significantly to research, right? The biomolecular research so that we can accelerate the drug discovery. We can accelerate how to do a new therapy, right? Because people now understand the big impact of pandemic or a big impact of a widespread disease that have a slow drug discovery rate. Now people are more aware of that and there are more demands on that. Right, we can feel it. I mean, like um, at least in the I3L Institute, that's why I3L uh, provide this um, very fast moving technology. Like we have um, biomedicine and bioinformatics. We can see this and we also integrate this in our curriculum. And then the automation. Right, automation means that, right, um, human labor, right, you know, like when they are offline, right, when um, movement are not restricted, um, they can proceed like usual, but when it is hit by, you know, like travel restriction, because people now are very much aware about the pandemic, then people will think, aware, oh, how, how am I going to conduct, um, activities without um, getting disrupted, without getting a, a burden by the you know pandemic situation. So the solution is automation. Automation here does not only belong to the industries, it also like you know like a digitalization and banking and etc. Right. And even like um doing a checkup right nowadays also people have the automation system. Right, where it allows us to do uh, several tasks more efficiently. Right now, people are looking at this. Right, people try to reduce all of this um, human-based labor now. So you you need to watch out. Right, they are they are several careers that may disappear in the future due to the automation. So th those careers are usually those are repeatable and can be replaced by artificial intelligence. Right, and then also. Um, e-commerce nowadays you know when we're thinking traditionally people like to think about okay we are selling things through the mall the shopping mall and shops and etc right but now right um the e-commerce allows us to reach uh much widely much more widely and then we can interact with way more customers so that is why 
right? This is why we are going to shift this trend and we are going to increase the demands of people who dwell in the area of the digi uh, digital marketing, digital online, and etc. And then, of course, the data science. When you deal with all of those, right, and the one that I mentioned earlier, of course, it requires an enormous amount of data management. Right, so this data management also, I mean, like in context of life science, is uh, the human genome, right? The human genomic data or the infectious uh, disease data. So it allows us to learn much faster, and then we learn about the big data analysis, so that it allows us to pinpoint um, solution troubleshooting and drug discovery in a much faster manner than before. Yeah, so. And then also people becoming more and more health conscious right now, right? And the demands for the healthy, nutritious food and supplement also increasing. And you see like they are online coaching for um, sports, yoga and et cetera. Now it's increasing as well because now to face the pandemic, people are uh, generally becoming more and more um, self-aware. Right now, if you look at the career examples from the shifting, Right in the healthcare way, you see like um the affection specialists, right? They are not the like technician. The companies like we have, I mean, like I actually have as um collaboration with many other medical diagnostic, like a GSI, right? The or the <coughs> the Calgan, right? We have um all of those, and then people also requires um telemedicine doctor, the healthcare professionals, right? So because of this um. A digitalization and um, connect, connecting people through the webs, right? And then we also need a drug discovery by informatician to speed up the drug discovery to prepare any potentially, um, they have the pandemic potential, right? And then food also, people are now looking at the fortified nutraceutical based food where, have, where they contain a bioactive um, ingredient, for example, like for immune boosting, anti-aging, cosmetic, and et cetera. Now people are paying attention to this. Now the demand of this is increasing significantly. Now people want to look younger, healthier, right? Because they are saying, okay, my life is short, right? Because of the pandemic, I, don't, I may be dying maybe like 10 years later because of the pandemic. So I need to look as healthy as possible. Right for the biotechnology, now also people are focusing on the um, drugs, right, and um, new therapeutics like vaccines. Right, last time you only learn like therapeutics from the inactivated viruses or inactivated um, bacteria. Now people are creating more and more like a more advanced type of vaccines. One of the easiest example is the mRNA vaccines that we are all currently using, like Pfizer and Moderna, or the virus based like AstraZeneca. Right, and then we are also um, having an increased demand on healthcare-based product and health supplements. Right, so upon realizing this, also ITL um, look at this uh, career post-pandemic and provide um, the students with the state-of-the-art laboratory and curriculum that allows the students to um, to excel and to um, to be able to do work in the career post-pandemic. Right. I think that will be all. I mean, if you have more, more information about I3L, you can go through the admissions. Right. Okay. That will be all. Uh, party, um, audience and participants. Participants. Yeah. Thanks. I would like to return this back to Nick. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Richard. That was uh, <clears throat> excuse me, very informative. I I was thinking about healthcare industry and, and I and I didn't realize just food. I really like that part about how. Even the food industry and how healthy eating is yes. <clears throat> changed. Um, I think that was because it can be overwhelming what's changed, right? And, yes. Uh, some, some direct examples like that are excellent. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of uh, questions from the crowd, uh, and I'll put these both, all the questions for both Andrew and Dr. Richard uh, to handle. Um, all right, so I have one that's a little bit away from the topic of uh, the pandemic, but I think it's a good question, especially for Asian students. Uh, it's a topic that I'm, that I'm pretty passionate about. And it says, if a student, if a student uh, is to take a psychology major in college, 
what types of careers would be available in the future? I'm guessing besides psychologists, <laughs> which is the easy answer. So uh, either either panelist, if you have some ideas about that. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll just start first. You know, uh, so maybe I'll just look at uh, some of the, the the students that we have done for psychology and where they end up. Uh, a few of our students, in fact, they are not a psychologist. You know, uh, uh, we have actually students who end up working in companies. Uh, analyzing trends, right? So these are part of, of, of that, that, that business of uh, looking at psychology as well. So a uh, very classic example, I, I know of one student who actually is a graduate in psychology, but because at SMU, uh, we, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they are allowed to take a second major, right? So this makes it very interdisciplinary in a way that you are able to practice both. So we have these students, uh, is actually working for, a, for uh, a, a trading company, a stock trading company, looking at the stocks of uh, you know, the FMCG shares, right? For example, Coca-Cola, right? So this guy was look, looking at the shares of Coca-Cola. Why? Because they, on his on site, he's looking at the psychology part of it, uh, the, the taste, the consumption patterns and all this. So this is part of that psychology as well. So, uh, so what, what, what we are trying to do is, in, in, uh, is there isn't a place where you, know, you, you study this and you need to end up some in, in this career. You know? uh, it's, it's not like uh, medicine, where you study medicine and you end up being a doctor. I think in, in this part of the world, I think a lot of this, uh, we are looking at uh, 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 being more interdisciplinary. So psychology, you can study and end up many, many different industries uh, looking into helping a company uh, develop a product because you look at the psychology of people or the consumption pattern and all this. So marketing, you can work in that as, part, as well. So psychology, you can work in HR, why? Right? Because, you know, there are people, you know, how people think, how people react to a, a certain policies. So uh, in fact, there, there isn't any anything that you really define you that you need to study psychology and you need to follow this path, right? So the career pathway is actually quite quite broad. Excellent, great answer, uh, Mr. Andrew. That uh, that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of uh, business opportunities, um, counseling on site for corporations, product development, stock market, right? Finance guys are constantly dealing with the psychology. Uh, excellent. Uh, Dr. Richard, since we're running out of time, I have a question that, that would fit you pretty well with your background uh, okay. in, in biology and, and biotech stuff. We have a student asking that with the changes in careers like life science, healthcare, food production, a lot of the biochem type of careers that are changing a lot right now, do you think that these changes are here to stay or do things... Uh, possibly go back to normal in four to five years. It seems like maybe there's an apprehension to jump on a change bandwagon if everything goes back to normal in a few years, right? So what are your thoughts on that? Okay, now um, the changing back the bandwagon, I mean like the changing is not because we are fitting to, fitting to certain type of disease. Right, the changes that happening during the pandemic is that right we are developing a more efficient system and then a rap a more rapid system that allows us to counter to deal to troubleshoot to um you know to solve the problem of the not the, the disease is not only in the pandemics, but for non-pandemics as well, because you know that there are many diseases like comorbids, right, that increases the risk of um, death and hospitalization, hospitalization for um, COVID-19, right? Now people are getting more and more aware, right? So of course, the development, right, will make this life science system move forward. We are evolving to the new era. Of course, we are not getting back, right? Because getting back, they are traditional way of approaches where they are less efficient. Now we are moving forward. We are getting more efficient. We are getting more technologically more advanced. 
sense and we are getting better at connecting ideas to build a better healthcare systems, be it the production or the bio-related industries. Okay. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Richard. Yes, um, you're welcome. Yeah, so it's not the specifics that are changing. It's the, yes. the way we're the looking way, at the whole yes. system. So the way we are looking at the hard to think that it's going to go back to a less efficient, no. less efficient way. Nope. Like what we are currently doing right now, right? We are not moving, you know, where we need to meet face-to-face, -face, but we're still using Zoom to connect the panelists and the audiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely hear that. And what was it uh, that you were saying, Mr. Andrew, you were saying about uh, you live in the world vulnerable, uncertain, you had a word for it I hadn't heard. Yeah, the v word is called VUCA, V-U-C-A. V yeah. Vulnerable, so like uncertain. Complex and ambiguous. And we are actually in this world right now, right? So uh, everything is changes uh, with, with a, a flip of a, a, a eyelid, you know? So the thing is, you know, we, we need to teach people, you know, if plan A fail, you know, how, what happens when you're, you have to implement your plan B and sometimes your plan C as well, right? So it's, there's no straight list, you know, um, plan anymore, you know, it doesn't, sometimes plan will, will change right so uh, things will, will change right so uh, if pandemic comes you know we know how how we should be able to switch so these are things that we, we are teaching our students right now excellent i i agree and here at here at dbs um bringing in more creativity and and pushing the idea of adapt right? like sticking to old systems not an effective way memorizing an old textbook not yep. gonna help Right, we yep. need to be adaptable uh, and ready for whatever the future throws at us next, right? Because who knows what it will be. Um, so I like that the change, not just in what we're teaching, but the way we're teaching it. So yeah, uh, I hope that resonates to the high school students here. That uh, when when your teachers are pushing that creativity and adaptability, the universities agree with us. They want you to be doing that as well, right? Um, last little thing for me, guys, I just want to mention to you that uh, uh, I want to see like if students ask for contact information after this, if we get requests, are you open to having your contact info shared or would you prefer having the um, we share you the students who request or just send them to the uh, inquiries, general inquiries at I3L, you know. What would you guys prefer if, if they do want to get in contact for more information from your specific schools? Okay, for, for us, definitely you'll be the general inquiries. So we have this admissions uh, with an S at the back, uh, admissions at smu.edu.sg because uh, okay. we have uh, dedicated staff who will answer to all different inquiries. Right. Perfect. Uh, we will make sure to forward that on uh, to the students. And Dr. Richard, do you have to contact I3L if they have questions. Okay, um, so for the uh, I3L, so it will be the same. Also, it will be like admissions at I3L.ac.id. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, uh, for the students that had some hand raises or some questions that we didn't have time to get to, I apologize, but it is nine o'clock. Our time is up. Students, you have a break before your next webinar. Uh, and please, everyone, uh, even though they can't hear you, give a round of applause and a thank you to Dr. Richard Stejo and uh, Andrew Lowe from SMU and I3L, respectively. Thank you very much for participating, guys. Um, thank you, Nate. Thank you, everyone. Yes, students, you have those contacts in the, in the uh, chat box there. But again, we'll make sure that your uh, campus counselor sends it out to you as well. Okay, uh, that is all. I'll contact you guys through email just to say my own thank yous. Everyone, you have a great day. Have and a great stay day, safe Nick. Out there. Yep. Okay, you can end it now. Shut it down.
Bouncer School Bando. Unit Bouncer School is set up to provide an internationally recognized education in Indonesia so that children can benefit from a good education. Bina Bangsa Secondary School prepares your child to excel in the IGCSE program. And as students enter the Junior College program, they learn to balance academics with co-curricular activities and out-of-school integrity, courage, compassion, so that we can become a better person. Visit our campus. dreaming, try to think about the problems you would like to solve in the society. You can start with that. And if you already have a dream, I would like you to add a date to the dream. The moment you add a date to the dream, your dream has become a goal. And what do you do with the goal? You will make a plan so that you can reach the goal. Make a small plan, big plan, medium plan. But you have to start planning and that planning, if you add action to it, it will make your dream come. 
children can benefit from a good education. Bina Bangsa Secondary School prepares your child to excel in the IGCSE program. And as students enter the junior college program, they learn to balance academics with co-curricular activities and out-of-school interests. The BS not only can teach you the education, it can also teach you how to improve your values and Try to think about the problems you would like to solve in the society. You can start with that. And if you already have a dream, I would like you to add a date to the dream. The moment you add a date to the dream, your dream has become a goal. And what do you do with the goal? You will make a plan so that you can reach the goal. Make a small plan, big plan, medium plan. Alright, good morning everyone. My name is Miss Emmy and I am from BBS Bandung. Hello, good morning everyone. I'm Miss Kenneth.
from BBS Balikpapan. Today, we will be moderating this live Q&A for this year's virtual annual EduFair on artificial intelligence. A good day to you, Ms. Emmy. Hi, Ms. Candice. How are you doing? Hi, um, thank you, Ms. Well, that's good. A pleasant morning to everybody. Today, we are gathered in this educational forum to learn more about artificial intelligence. It's very exciting. I hope everyone is doing well and excited to learn about AI. I'm sure many of you here are natural creatives, designers, aspiring engineers, entrepreneurs, artists, or maybe you just have a really big imagination. All the same, let's get into the learning mode. Over the course of the next 20 years, more will change around the way we do work than has happened in the last 2,000 years. In fact, I think we're at the dawn of a new age in human history. Now there have been four major historical eras defined by the way we work. The hunter-gatherer age lasted several million years, and then the agricultural age lasted several thousand years. The industrial age lasted a couple of centuries and now the information age has just lasted a few decades. And today, we are on the cusp of our next great era as a species. What do you say, Miss Candice? That's right, Miss Emmy. Welcome to the augmented age. In this new era, your natural human capabilities are going to be augmented by computational systems that help you think, robotic systems that make that help you make, and a digital nervous system that connects you to the world far beyond your natural senses. Let's start with cognitive augmentation. Artificial intelligence, or otherwise known as AI, refers to information about the language structure being transmitted to the machine. It should result in a more intuitive and faster solution based on a learning algorithm that repeats patterns in new data. Good results are usually obtained in imitating the cognitive processes whose several layers of densely connected biological subsystems are invariant to many input transformations. Wow, Miss Candice, that's actually very technical. Um, but without further ado, let's please welcome our guest speakers. All right, Miss Emmy. First off, he is a professor in the School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne and co-director for the Center of AI and Digital Ethics, or CAIDE. His primary area of expertise is in artificial intelligence with particular emphasis on human AI interaction and collaboration, explainable artificial intelligence, XAI, decision-making in complex multi-agent environments and reasoning about action and knowledge. His work is at the intersection of artificial intelligence, interaction design and cognitive science psychology, and his areas of education and expertise is in artificial intelligence, software engineering, and technological innovation. He has extensive experience developing novel and innovative solutions with industry and defense collaborators. He is also a member of the AI and Autonomy Lab in their school. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Tim Miller. Thank you very much. We are welcome, pleased Professor. to have you join us today. Mr. Yes, welcome. We are very pleased to have you join us today, Mr. Miller. Um, this is actually a very rare opportunity, right, Ms. Candice? Yes. <laughs> so our next guest speaker is from Zhejiang University, China and University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign Institute, who's also joining us today in the session on artificial intelligence. Dr. Yang's research interests cover various aspects of wireless communications, networking, and signal processing. Currently focusing on the modeling of modern wireless networks, high dimensional statistics, graph signal processing, and machine learning. He received the IEEE WSP 10 year anniversary excellent paper award in 2019 and the IEEE WCSP best paper award in 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Yang Hao. Welcome, Hi, hello. Professor. Hello. hello. 
Next, we are also indeed honored to have you join us, uh, Mr. Yang. To complete our panel of speakers, we will be joined by an expert in civil and environmental engineering. He earned his PhD in civil engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. His research interests include studies in soil behavior, geomechanics, landslide information systems, and of course, artificial intelligence. Currently, he is the Associate Dean of Engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Yu Sing Wang. I hope I read your name correctly, Professor. Apologies if not. And he is from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Welcome, okay. Professor. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so we have now our three guest speakers. Um, we are very delighted to have you all joining BBS teachers and students in one of the highlights of our academic year, and that is the Educational Fair Conference 2022. For sure, our audience, Ms. Emmy, is already very excited to hear from our speakers. Earlier, I tried to define artificial intelligence, of course, with a little help from uh, Google and a little research, but it would be better if our experts today added to that. Let us then begin by uh, the definition of AI, perhaps uh, in a nutshell. So to start with, may I please ask Mr. Miller, Professor Miller, to kindly define to us what AI really is, Professor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, hype and, around AI and, and a lot of people might think it seems like magic, but in my view, it's just a part of computer science. It's one part of computer science. Uh, and what differs from normal computer science is that when we do computer programming, normally uh, the computer programmer has to know how to solve the problem that they want to solve and they have to program the computer to do that. What's different with artificial intelligence um, is that we tend to uh, program the computer to solve the problem rather than come from the person's head. And so th the most common uh, aspect we use is called machine learning, where often it's for a lot of problems, it's actually very difficult for a human to figure out how to solve the problem. And it's actually easier if you have data to feed the data to a machine learning algorithm, and it will kind of tell you how to solve the problem itself. Um, and so that's the difference I really see is that we don't, it's not in the it's not in the computer programmer's head how you should solve a problem. It's extracted from the data or the models that, that you provide to it. Thank you, Professor Miller. Um, would any of our reputed um, guest speakers would like to add? Professor um, Wang, would you like to add to the uh, definition of what AI exactly is, sir? Uh, yes, just a very simple because it's a common question from the student. So, and I always use a very simple answer. I think all of you love to watch movie. And then the, you probably have a watch a movie the in, uh, imitate again. So basically the Turing was the first one we think he really made a, a substantial work in the field of artificial intelligence. So he has a very simple question. Can machine think? So if you look at the definition from the Cambridge di uh, Dictionary, just read it out. It's about a study of how to produce machine that have some of the qualities that the human mind has, such as the ability to understand language, recognize pictures, solve problems, and prayer. So I think that's a simple answer for uh, those who want to just quickly grasp uh, what is the idea for the artificial intelligence. So can machine think like a human? So that's our study. So we call intelligence, artificial intelligence. Yep, that's my short answer. Thank you, Professor Wang. Professor Yang, you would yeah, like to on. hear your two cents as well, please. Go ahead, uh, The sir. two professors, I think they have made this definition very clear. And uh, I, I would just like to add a little bit thing in the study. Um, I usually learn, uh, think from a more mathematical or statistical point of view. It's like in the past, we do statistics by uh, constructing some very sophisticated mathematical models. And that requires some genius to come up with very beautiful formulas. And uh, with machines, I think uh, it's like, we have complicated data uh, abundancy, and then we use computers to extract those hidden knowledges from those observations, rather than like we are coming up with some recipe 
by uh, those very brilliant mathematicians. Yeah. And I think the current stage of machine learning is something like more in this trend. Thank you very much, Professor Yang. So there we go. Uh, to our attendees and our audience, uh, we hope we are giving you a little glimpse into what exactly AI is and perhaps spark interest in those uh, imaginative minds of ours. Yeah. Thank you so much for your input. Um, Ms. Emmy, yeah. the next question, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Thank you. you are right, Ms. Candice. So thanks very much for giving us this input. Um, actually, so first and foremost, we had some technical definition come in from Mr. Miller and then um, being explained in layman's term by Professor Wang and lastly in mathematical sense. So thanks very much. I hope, yeah, indeed, our students now have a better understanding of what computer or artificial intelligence is. But can I please ask um, this time, um, Professor Wang, I would like you to start us off. Um, why is it that we need artificial intelligence? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Uh, so uh, I, I'm a civil engineer. So basically I'm outside the CS field. So probably I can provide different view about why we need an AI. So think about uh, today, uh, if, we love, if we don't have a computer for one day, or you don't have your mobile phone for one day, you feel your life is miserable. You cannot do anything without a computer. <laughs> right? So that, I think that's a, probably we're back to a few decades before, when the first time we have a computer, and then probably not a lot of people need a computer. So, uh, so if we look at history for deep learning, it used to be a uh, neural network, uh, the people uh, using the similar concept, but with a few layers. And then uh, it turns out it become a, a failure product, but those people didn't give up. They continue to develop the deep learning model now. So people ask those people, do you think that uh, deep learning will like a neural network become a failure product? I think the answer is very simple from the Yali Kuhn say, no, because you look at uh, deep learning now, know, AI is, deep learning is a subset of AI. So basically uh, AI is everywhere, right? It's your rice cook in, uh, in your mobile phone. So once you become everywhere, you probably cannot have it. But why do we need AI? The simple answer from me is, Right. Uh, we used to learn computer. We do uh, learn how to do the programming. So it's just like a very important tool for the engineers. So now it's like an AI. So we can use AI to do similar thing, but it's even more advanced level. Uh, computer used to be programmable, but AI is learnable. So it's not only we can program the AI algorithm, we also can use AI, you can learn. So is it become, to me, it's a great tool for us, for engineers, to deal with a lot of tedious work, to uh, help us process massive amount of data, et cetera. So that's the reason we need AI, and AI is everywhere now. Yeah, that's my short answer. Thank you so much indeed. You're you're making it look as if um, artificial intelligence is very easy. So thanks for that. Um, can we please have Mr. Miller to add on to that one? And you can also sir, tell us um, in addition, the pros and cons of AI, if you mean, thank you. So I guess why do we need AI can be answered from two dimensions. Um, why do we need, need AI rather than computer programming? Um, it's, it's, it's what Professor Wang just said and what I said earlier. Sometimes it's easier to learn how to do something from, from previous data that, than it is to program it ourselves. Um, so from that perspective, that's why computer scientists um, like artificial intelligence. Now, why do we need, why, why would anyone outside of computer science, such as Professor Wang, want it? Um, part of the reason is because what machine learning models are able to do is consider a lot of factors at one time. So when you've got a human who's making a decision, we can consider five, maybe six different things at once uh, when we really think very hard about it, when we're an expert at it. Um, but if you look at uh, things that are in use, for, for example, to decide whether someone should have a business loan approved, they have about 10,000 things that that model will consider at one time. It's, it's far more than a human brain can do. So from the perspective of an application, um, that's a really good way to do things. To, to answer the pros and cons, well, one of the pros is that it allows us to, to answer questions and solve new problems that we couldn't solve before. One of the 
the, the disadvantage is these models are really big and we don't understand them very well. Uh, and that makes it very hard for regulators, um, makes it very hard for users to figure out are these decisions being made in our best interests. Um, so that, that's the sort of the pro and the con is the scale on, on both sides. <clears throat> Thanks very much for your input, sir. Um, shall we ask uh, Mr. Uh, Wang this time regarding um, why we need AI? Again, you can also add to the pros and cons, sir. Oh, so you, uh, I think, you, uh, so uh, the pros and cons, I think uh, just uh, as a, uh, 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 as, a, as a Professor Miller say, I think a lot of people think it's a black box. So we don't know how the AI works. So then you have a result. But uh, uh, it's not really uh, a cons because uh, uh, people think about the regulation. How can we test a model? How can we, even though uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, just a very simple, we say, okay, we can have this model, but even though you use the same same type of uh, our same model. If you use different data set to train the model, and the model uh, performance will be different. And then model performance will also change with time, with uh, spatial variation. So it's a lot of uh, uh, cons there. It's just uh, uh, how can we do the quality control? How can we consider those ethical issues once we use uh, uh, AI? So that's a, that's a Comes, I think pools as a right, no, no need to mention. It really solves us a lot of time to deal with a very tedious work. So uh, most of the time we use AI to help us process data and then they never complain. So that they can work 24 hours per day, per day, seven days a week. But once they process the very tedious data and they consider all aspects, I think that will save us a uh, human a lot of time to make a better decision. I think that's a great uh, pause for us. Uh, thanks very much, sir. Uh, may we please have the insights coming from Professor Yang this time. Um, sir, can you please tell us regarding the typical jobs related to artificial intelligence? Because um, sometimes if you say computer science, right? some students are quite like afraid to take the subject because um, possibly they don't understand what jobs they might have later on so they might be thinking just about computer and stuff but uh, we know from talking to you now that it's more a lot about computer so can you please tell us regarding any other typical jobs that we can um, do related to artificial intelligence sir uh that's a good question i think uh regarding the jobs uh one common job is to become a professor <laughs> you do research <laughs> on how this uh, uh how this field is progressing and uh more down to the earth i think uh in most of these uh high-tech companies um one you can do um the autonomous driving um there's still a very difficult field and it's still very thriving and um as professor wang said i think um there are some small spots that um many of the situations is that um the pro of AI is to, to free us from the tedious jobs. So I think uh, in many startups that um, they might be concentrated on a vertical field that is trying to solve some like um, some dedicated problems that is just to, to, to free us, to, to replace the tedious repetitive jobs with the machines, with the AIs, that could be one, one part. Uh, I think uh, a typical example in those like high tech company is like the recommendation system that um they they learn your pattern they learn your pattern of like uh on youtube uh, your your pattern of your or your preference of viewing which type of these videos and then they try to reinforce or collect those uh, videos that are similar and then they try to recommend it to you and many of the uh r and d positions in this um uh, it uh in these internet companies, I think uh, a portion of jobs related to AI is like this. And another 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 application is something called Grammarly. Um, as we uh, at, at least me, I, I use it heavily to check the spelling errors in my in my writing. And those things like it also frees us from you know from those like small errors 
And uh, those things, I think, uh, are excellent examples that AI really puts into the real world. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Yang, for that input. And indeed, so let's, I just would like to uh, um, add to the idea of research that you uh, professors are doing, because being a, a chemistry teacher myself, um, um, well, a teacher in, in, a, in a school, um, maybe not the way as you do research at university, but um, also central to what scientists do is experiment in the laboratories. So yeah, we, we really understand what you're trying to say to us regarding research. And it's very, very important in the development of artificial intelligence. So Ms. Candice, um, feel free to ask them the next questions. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Ms. Uh, um, uh, may we please, I'm sure the audience or attendees are interested to know, what are the typical jobs related to AI? Yeah. Can I direct that to Professor Miller first? Sir. Um, I'd say, I mean, building on from, from Howard's thing, I'd say mo most commonly what people uh, are doing is one of two things. Um, most most people are in advertising, as it turns out. So people who work in artificial intelligence at Google and Facebook, their primary job is to try and get you to click on ads. And that's somewhat of the unfortunate dirty secret of, of machine learning is that that's what most of the most brilliant minds in the field are doing, getting you to click on ads. But other people are doing more meaningful stuff. But the most typical one is what, what I would call business analytics, which is taking data about customers and sales and trying to predict the future of what will happen. So for example, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to the head of data science at a big supermarket chain here in Australia, and they do what they call product scheduling. They're trying to figure out in one month's time, how many of all of our products should we stock in every one of our stores? Um, and they do that uh, every day. They forecast a month ahead. Uh, in order to try and just get the right amount of stock so that they don't run out and <clears throat> that they uh, they don't run out and then they, they don't have too much stock of something. And so they have to do that for every little thing. And so, for example, if you just want to have a particular type of ice cream, there's lots of different factors that can influence how many of those ice creams you're going to sell. Is it what, what's the weather? Is it a weekend? Is it a public holiday? All those things will all impact how many they do. And that's their job to sit and do that. But business analytics is where there is a lot of um, really a lot of people working right now. Hi, right, thank you very much, Professor Miller. So business analytics, you guys, okay? Those are listening to us. Um, Professor Wang, would you like to add more info about the uh, jobs related to AI, sir? Yeah, sure. Uh, I probably want to offer a different point of view about uh, the typical job and then uh, you, okay. I think it's probably also relevant to the following several questions. Uh, mm -hmm. People are always concerned, will AI take our jobs? Okay, but let's go back yes. to the typical. Uh, as an educator, the typical is relative. So uh, student now studying university, so after they graduate, so maybe there's some jobs that didn't exist now. So they are doing something totally different. So typical, maybe now is typical. When they graduate, uh, might not be typical anymore. So uh, in the family educator point of view, we want to produce future engineer. So starting from two years ago, uh, I just use my university's one example in engineering school. We have so-called extended major in AI because we believe everyone needs to have some concept and some skills relevant to the AI no matter what will be your major. So for example, I can choose civil engineer as my major, but I also can choose some, uh, it's my extended major with some courses in the AI. The reason is very simple. So now uh, we did a lot of project with the government, but when the government officials, they want to write a tender document, if they don't know AI, how can they prepare the tender document and how can they, uh, supervise those contractor and mm -hmm. achieve the goal. They even don't know how to pay the money, whether or not the AI really give them yes. good results. So if it looks like uh, everyone need to have the concept with AI, and then uh, most of the time we think about what will be the, your future working more. It is not the only AI. So basically it should be the AI plus robot and the human in the loop. So you will have an AI, 
colleagues and also robot colleagues in the future. But a human is always important. So we always want to tell people, just like a civil engineer, uh, I, I teach students four years knowledge about civil engineers. Are we going to just uh, throw it away because AI is going to do everything? No, it certainly is not. The domain knowledge is always important. So we always need to combine AI, robot, and also the domain knowledge people together. That will be the future working mode. And then that is uh, how the educator want to uh, cultivate or help students to equip themselves for the future typical job. <laughs> yeah, that's my short answer. Thank you so much, Professor Wang. That was very enlightening. I couldn't agree more. Regardless of our major, I'd like to pick up on that point. I think we should know the concept of what AI is and how it can empower us, like teachers ourselves. AI has been with us for quite some time, sir, and uh, our work just really got easier, more convenient because of AI. So, um, and this is this is human knowledge. This is evolution, you know, uh, at its finest. So why? And I do understand where some people are coming from, why they fear AI might you know, get their jobs and everything's automated. You know? So thank you. Thank you for that, Professor Wang. Indeed. Um, may I ask um, Professor Yang if you would like to add a little input on that, sir? Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, uh, I think Professor Wang has uh, pointed out a very good point that um, no matter which subject you are learning, um, like AI or machine learning is like a tool set. Like uh, I feel like every major, every subject we need to learn this. Like my supervisor back when I was PhD, it's like uh, uh, machine learning is like the new tool of optimization because when we do engineering, it's always about this trade-off, about this optimization. So using the data that we collected, it provides us a new perspective to how to do the balance between like um, cost and uh, performance. And uh, that's that, uh, but still I think um, um, there are certain aspects, I think um, uh, using the techniques of machine learning will have a more direct outcome. Like, uh, like um, in, Ch in China, I think uh, one is the, the, uh, like the, 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 the check weight, like when we go to uh, take the coach, or it, or take the chain. It used to be a lot of this, uh, uh a, a lot of these kinds, uh, to 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 check to identify whether you are really really the the customers who 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 is who buy the who bought the ticket. But now most of it is like this uh, face recognition system, and it is it is deployed in large scale. And I think in some domains, uh, AI has a more direct impact. Um, uh, but I. A, a negative thing is that it might be overheated, and uh, on top of this, uh, I, I I saw that some of the uh, some of the questions is like, uh, will it have a negative impact, and how does this automation will affect our job? I think the trend of automation is like uh, inevitable. It's not necessarily related to AI. It's like in the past hundred years. We like the the car has been uh the the, the horse is replaced by cars and uh this uh yeah mobile uh mobile bikes and all these things are, are all automations right um AI is like just like the the automation in the twenty first century or something like uh, <laughs> yeah I I think um it is just automized the some of the parts that we cannot do it before so yeah that's my that's my point. Thank you so much, Professor Yang, for your input. Thank you. So, Zoomers, <laughs> attendees, are we? Are you still with us? <laughs> Interesting, huh? Everybody's learning. I'm I'm learning a lot. Okay, thank you. So, Miss Emmy, go ahead, please. Next question. I'm sure they're having um a lot of fun learning and note take it. Hopefully, our secretary to JC too are doing so. Um. Let me just carry on on the input of our professors, especially on the idea that in the future we might have, but actually maybe in some workplaces already, they've got robot colleagues as mentioned by Professor Wang earlier, and the automization, which has been explained well by Professor Yang. Um, can I just please ask Professor Miller this time? 
can AI take over the world? Because I think most of us are quite interested um, on your input. Ooh, interesting question. <laughs> I actually take over the world, sir. I think it, not unless we tell it to, um, we explicitly tell it to, but I mean, I, I don't think so. There is this movement around uh, exist, ex, existential risk um, that um, the, the AI will become so intelligent that it will take over the world. And so the example that uh, a well-known philosopher, Nick Bostrom from Oxford University gives is that you might give AI the goal of just making as many paper clips as possible, which seems very trivial, um, but in, if it has to make as many paper clips as possible, it might do things. It might learn that the first thing it has to do is kill all the humans uh, in order that it could get the get the, the the materials to make it make it, and it might build a um, a, a ship to fly different planets to do it, etc. Um, but I think to be so intelligent as to take over the world, the first thing that you would need is artificial intelligence that's able to that has common sense, which is we we don't have that right now. All it can do is just replicate statistical patterns uh, and it seems to me if you've got artificial intelligence that has so much common sense it can take over the world it will also have enough common sense to know that you shouldn't kill people just to make paper clips um, so i think these arguments that something will become so intelligent will take over the world it kind of is contradictory because it will also be so intelligent it will realize like a human being um, you don't kill people to make paper clips <clears throat> here uh, thank you so much Okay, I feel good right now. <laughs> okay, uh, Professor Wang, uh, any comments on that? Any thoughts, sir? Yeah, I just uh, I think it's a quite common question from the student. I would just say, yeah, you watch too much movie. So uh, it's, it's like not, Transformers, it's, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> or yeah. something think, similar. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not there yet. And then if you really understand, I mean. Uh, you have a you, you can start to understand AI and understand uh, how the AI uh, in different kind of applications. Then you will understand as a lot of uh, uh, issues remain. Yeah, so I uh, to me, it's, I always think it's a great tool to help us. And he will not become. We should be uh, okay. And I think that's where it's good. I, I, I read from the article. We should be empowered by AI not overpowered by AI. Yeah, that's my short answer. Wow, yeah. Let me just repeat that. We must be empowered, empowered. by AI. AI, not overpowered by AI. I yeah. think Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. For, forget about um, I, where I, I saw it from the website. I don't remember who said that. <laughs> I just plagiarized the term. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, possibly we've been watching too much movies. <laughs> <Yes. Okay. laughs> Professor Yang, any thoughts on that? Because yeah, as we said, it's actually really a common question. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I would like to add uh, two, two things. One is that um, uh, five years ago, I think, uh, when I was uh, still a PhD student, at that time, I'm, I'm a little bit panicked. I feel like hey, this, this term machine learning is eating every field. It's like it's penetrating into every aspect of the engineering research. And but five years later, I think uh, I found that it still has a lot of issues. And uh, just as Professor Wang said, uh, it should empower the us rather than overpower us. And uh, it's doing. And one interesting example is that when we do the interview, college entrance interview this year, and I asked a a a, a a high school student, and he he kind of he liked to he want to become a translator, like he want to learn English and become a translator in the future. And then like I like I I asked him like um, dudes, NLP natural language processing is so it's advancing so fast. I don't think I think in the future we just need something to attach to our ear, and then like it's automatically done. Who needs a translator? And then. He, he responds to me like, uh, but you know, machines don't have emotions. So sometimes um, if you say something and then I translate it, I, I can feel that emotion and then I can translate it maybe in another sentence that can resonate those feelings. And then I felt, oh, that's a that's a good point. It's like, yeah, it's like AI is not taking everything. It still has, like human beings still have something <laughs> that's deeper that's from the machine. 
yeah. And aside from that, I, I think uh, and machine learning is like a, a very fantastic tool, but it should not be like um, over uh, over emphasized. Yeah, it should empower us rather than overpower us. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I hope that student was accepted. Was he accepted? He, she? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> accepted. Um, the students. Okay, fantastic. Um, so let's just carry on on that. And this time I'm going to throw this question to Professor, back to Professor Miller. And the question, sir, is that um, how will artificial intelligence change the future? Um, I mean, I, I don't think it will change it any much more differently than the way the computing has over the last sort of 40 years, that will just continue to be part of the software that we run um, on our mobile phones, on our desktops, on web servers, everywhere. Uh, it'll largely be invisible. We won't know that we're interacting with AI in particular. It will just look like, um, it will just look like software. Um, what we've already talked a little bit about what it's going to do is take away some tasks um uh, from us um the, the interesting i'll come back to it was an earlier question about will ai steal our jobs i mean mm -hmm. so how it will change it will possibly steal some people's jobs um so the best example would be what we have now is financial actuaries who are people who do things like try and figure out how much i should charge you for insurance based on how old you are and these types of things they might possibly lose their job to ai because there will be other people with data science skills who will come in and, and have the financial uh, background who will come in and do that if they're not willing to retrain themselves. But they won't be replaced by AI, they'll be replaced by somebody else who knows how to use AI. Um, and those types of jobs will go. I think that the, there will be some people who won't necessarily lose their jobs to AI because AI can do what they do, but AI will shrink up the, the income for. So the best example is journalists. Um, right now the journalists have have basically lost their jobs to the internet not because the internet can write journalistic articles but because it's stealing all the advertising money that used to go to newspapers now there's no income for journalists and i think we'll see things like that that will steal income from uh, particular particular uh, jobs and those jobs will dry up as a result but the, the jobs themselves won't be so i think the, the future will be just uh very slowly creeping around and and changing our world in ways we're not really sure um, how it's going to be in five years. Right. Um, so, in well, we've got the pros and we've got the cons of the advancement of technology. And yeah, as you just have mentioned regarding um, those um, journalists. So I hope our students, um, if you would like to be a journalist in the future, I hope that doesn't make you feel bad. Um, you need to follow what your dream. But then, mm -hmm. of course, we need think about the advancement as well so maybe in the future there's going to be or, or maybe it's already happening um advancement in journalism um, using artificial intelligence so yeah okay and professor Wang, how about in your expertise or in your field um what do you think how will ai change the future uh, yes, I think uh, as just uh, your opening uh, introduction say the information age only a few decades already change a lot. So I always tell my student, um, I'm, I'm very sorry, uh, your world is changing so fast. Probably every three to five years, there's a different new technology coming to the market, even shorter time. So uh, I think in the future, it will change a lot uh, for our industry. But uh, uh, I encourage students to be, uh, for example, civil engineer, but you know, the AI as a tool. So you can be a civil engineer, but you also know the AI skills. And then you will be a very important person and then you can find a very good job because uh, we still need a civil engineer, but we need a civil engineer with AI skills. And then uh, just take one example, we have a lot of uh, different kinds of application in the civil engineering, but low things in the past, just for example, uh, in Hong Kong, sometimes uh, you will see people counting vehicles. So every year we will do those uh, consensus about the vehicle, the transportation, and then uh, for different purposes, the, for the tra transportation management, also for the street air pollution estimation. Every car is a pollutant source. But now you can put a camera, but uh, uh, it, it will be easy to identify different kind of vehicle. But uh, uh, 
You know the situation in Hong Kong a few years ago. Now you put a camera on the street. Everyone will argue, hey, I have my data privacy. You cannot put a camera. So, okay, we don't put camera. Then we put a LiDAR. Uh, how to describe LiDAR? You know, laser light. Okay, so you still can use LiDAR. And then people want to recognize the data, uh, your face. But it's, we still know it is a car. So we move from 2D to 3D, and we still can use AI to help us identify different vehicle. So I think my point is the world changing so fast. And then as an educator in the university, we just uh, provide the student ability to learn different things. So they have ability to learn AI. They also have ability to learn uh, more advanced AI when they go to the industrial, when they begin to work. I think the world is keeping changing, but uh, we have an ability to learn. So we can be the future engineer and make an even bigger contribution to the world. Although uh, the future will be very different from now. Yes, that's my short answer. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, listening to you, um, I am very excited for the future, wh wherever it's going to take us, um, artificial intelligence wise. And you are indeed right as educators, you know, we just give them the knowledge and then hopefully our students in the future is going to be using that knowledge to make sure that we survive as a species. <laughs> so I'm still going on on the idea of, you know, uh, AI taking over our jobs and stuff. Okay, Professor Yam, how about in your field of expertise, sir? Um, uh, how yes, is uh... AI changing? Sure. Uh, I, I I think my feel is more like um, it's more like building the road that is connecting the data to 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 human being. This is connecting the building the high highway for information. So we do wireless con uh, connectivity, building the wireless access points. And one concrete example is that um, there was one professor in our field, not me, and he helped this Huawei company, which uh, deploy a lot of this wireless base stations for us, for our phones to access to the backbone network in a city in China. And um, actually one issue with the uh, 5G wireless network, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are talking about uh, AI and then sometimes we talk about this 5G and 6G. One big issue about this 5G network is that we deploy so many uh, base stations they are very small. They cover a small area. Um, they provide you high data rates, but they are very, very energy consuming. They they consume a lot of this electrical electricity. So um, so most of the revenue goes to the electrical company rather than the, the rather than the telecommunication companies. And um, therefore, one team uh, of this uh, this professor they collect this data and then from those base stations and then they develop a scheme that use this big data technology to control the on off periods of those base stations over a big city over a lot very large city and then they decrease the power consumption by 50 percent that's a lot a lot a lot of gain and this is like, I think a concrete example that this machine learning technology can put into the real world and really benefits a lot of us. And on the other hand, um, in specifically in the domain of this communications, um, one, one buzzword currently is something called semantic communication is what is something like, now we are seeing each other because because the camera capture what we are seeing on the screen and then reconstruct all the things on your screen. And, but actually what we are really communicating are the things that is underlated or encoded in our languages or our gestures, those semantics. And uh, one current trend in the communication theory or the society is that uh, we are trying to extract the real meaning of our communication contents and transmit that thing instead of the whole trunk of original um, information to the other end. So um, that is 
perhaps it is a, a direction for the future, but I don't know. But um, as Professor Wang said, the future is changing so dynamically. It is on the one hand, uh, a little bit sorry for the student, but on the other hand, it's very exciting for the researchers, I think. So um, yeah, so a good direction to work is to be a professor. <laughs> uh, thank you so much um, for your input. Um, yes, so just one for me, anyone can answer this question. Um, because most of our students at BBS, and this is all the campuses, uh, most of them, they, they go abroad to study. That's why we've got this educational fair. And those who would like to take computer science and then related artificial intelligence, I think they would like to know which countries are leading in artificial intelligence. So anyone can pick that question? Which countries are leading in artificial intelligence? <laughs> we could I, think be be, I think it should be Google, Facebook, not countries. <laughs> Yeah, yeah company. <laughs> so companies. Not a country, uh, I think. Not, That's my not specifically the countries. <laughs> so right. Um, uh, students and parents, um, so it's not country. So it's we are in a globalized network. So it is companies, not countries. Thank you so much for clarifying that. This kind no, of my own, just my personal view, yeah. Professor <laughs> Miller, do you agree? That it's not about the country, it's about the company. Yeah, I mean, there's two things, there's two ways to look at it. Um, yes, that's right. So it's it's large scale companies that are, are dominating it. I would say they're predominantly in China and North America. So you could say from that they're their own from that. That's that's the case. But from an educational perspective, I mean, it almost doesn't matter, right? I mean, we we all from an educational perspective, we all have access to how to do this. Um, and, and you can go and study in any country and then go and work in, in one of the big countries if you want. I don't think it matters from the educational point of view um, where you study. Just pick somewhere you want to go and somewhere that's got a good program for what you want to do. Thank you, sir. I think you put it beautifully. Right, students, it doesn't matter where you study, okay, as long as you're going to be applying that um, course that you're going to be taking later on. Okay, Miss Candice. Um, you would like to ask All right. the next question? Yes, um, our next question right here. We also have some questions coming in the Q&A chat box, by the way. If you have extra time later, probably Miss Emmy, uh, a few. We could read a few. Uh, if you have extra time towards the session um, later. Yes, but we'll uh, see. Let's have okay, we'll see if time accommodates. So apologies to those. We do see your questions, but um, we need to cover um, uh, some of the questions we already prepared. Okay, you guys. But thank you very much for those. We are reading them right now. Okay, so um, our next question then would be, since we have been, uh, we stand corrected, not countries, companies. Okay, um, how much research uh, is already available about usable AI technologies? How much research is out there already? Uh, probably Professor Yang, could you tell us something about uh, the availability or accessibility of research uh, for usable AI technologies out there? Usable AI technology, I think um, uh, on the one hand, um, from educational point of view, um, most of the, I think um, there are two things. One is that Many of the researchers, they research, they build on top of foundation. You need to first know what it is doing, and then you build on top or specify to what the problem that you are solving. So I think um, currently the basics for understanding AI, there are abundant amount of resources online, and even if YouTube, Google, and you can find many excellent um, online courses from many of the uh, good universities around the world. And um, on the other hand, um, there are also companies that they are providing their, um, most of them state-of-the-art AI models that can be easily accessed, or you can use this for a, like a small amount of money. And uh, you, can, you can build your own uh, deep learning models and you can 
rents the servers for uh, not um, not very expensive for uh, certain periods and then train your model and then either you want to learn something or you want to use that to 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 help you uh, get the outcome of your of your task yeah um they are much available now i think um and i i feel like my perspective is that currently one important uh issue or aspect from the ai domain is that um how can we learn a good model uh, on the basis of private data because uh with the with the advance of this ai technology many countries are like imposing these regulations on privacy is, is that data is like oil uh we can use it and to to come up with very powerful models but that will but if it's built on top of the threat to humans uh privacy at least for me every time like apple asks me do you do you agree to share this with us i always click no <laughs> yeah so um so um i think right. um so yeah, so currently they, they are this trend about like privacy uh AI and how, how to build powerful models based on private data. Thank you, Professor Yang. So it's data privacy. Uh exactly uh, definitely something important we need to know about, right? Data protection, data privacy. Thank you for that, uh Professor Yang. Professor Wang, this time, uh, your input, please, sir. Oh, okay. Uh so I I just want to say, uh, indeed, the AI is a, a very wide range of applications. I will just take a civil and environmental engineering as a one example. Right? Uh, what do you think the people uh, AI can do, like a face recognition? But in, indeed, we use the AI to help us to do the environmental impact assessment. We can monitor bird. So we can use AI to help us uh, watching the bird, to classify bird, uh, watching the bird behavior. We also can put a sensor on the tree. We can use AI to help us monitor any anomaly tilting angle from the trees. We can monitor vehicle, different vehicle, and we can do the traffic control. We also can monitor the air pollution control. We also can, uh, using the mobile mapping system, you go into the building and do a quick scan. We can use AI model to help us process data to understand where you can find those defects. So there's a many, many, uh, really, if you can image more, right? Just uh, use your imagination. A lot of uh, application that you can use AI. But the, the point is, uh, uh, I, I saw there's a question there. So should we start to learn AI? My answer is yes, you should do it. Okay, that's my answer. Thank you, Professor Wang. Yes, you should do it. Strike while the iron is hot, they say. Now is the time. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Wang. All right. Um, I, I would also want to point out, um, there are many fields where in AI definitely is prevalent. Technology, medicine, uh, environment as well, right? So this is definitely something that we should uh, that should empower humanity, like what Professor Wang said earlier. Thank you so much. And Professor Miller, we'd like to hear your two cents as well, please. Um, I mean, is this still the question about what research is available? Are we, this where we yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, sir, uh, research things, available out there, yeah. Yeah, one of the great things about uh, computer science research right now um, is that there's uh, everyone makes their, their research papers publicly available almost all the time. There's a very good resource called the Archive, which is A-R-X-I-V, which is a repository that almost everybody in computer science puts their papers on and they're freely available, research papers. And many, many people, especially in universities, but even in big tech companies, make their source code for their computer programs available as well. And sometimes the data they might use is also made available, which means that there's, there's lots of resources for people to use. Not always the case, but much more than in any other field, I think that that's happening right now. Um, so it's not very difficult, as, as Professor Yang said, it's not very difficult to go out and get uh, Google's deep learning tool and use it. It's, I mean, if you know how to use it, it's there and it's, 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 there's a very low barrier to entry and anybody with the skills can download it. Thank you so much, Professor Miller. All right, uh, Miss, uh, hang on, Miss Emmy, time check. 
Okay, let's just make sure that we don't go over time. <laughs> Although we have we have had a very uh, productive discussion. Thank you very much to our guest speakers. Ms. Amin? I couldn't agree more. And being in the science field, yeah, at first I was like, um, okay, this is going to be a learning curve for me as well. So yeah, very thankful that I've actually said yes to hosting this event. So Wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank no. you that there are still questions um, from the students and also our questions but yes time is off um, I didn't even notice that was already 55 minutes um, so I think um, it's really been a fruitful discussion today so um, for our attendees and um, special students I hope that you really gained a lot of valuable insights and information about artificial intelligence and that you are now well informed and confident if you are actually going to be going into computer science, um, speaking and sorry, listening from our experts here. Ms. Candice? Thank you so much uh -huh. to our attendees. Uh -huh. they, oh, sorry, sir. You were saying? Oh, uh, I'm sorry if I cut anyone. <laughs> I was about to thank everybody. Thank you so much for our attendees. And of course, to Mr. Miller, Mr. Yang, and Mr. Wang for your presence. Thank you for gracing this event um, for our webinar today. We truly, truly appreciate you having uh, been with us in this Q&A portion. It's been a great speaking. It's been great speaking with you to experts on artificial intelligence. So, um, we hope you can join us again for another session on AI if we have to conduct another webinar of the same nature, right, Ms. Amy? <laughs> I would love to have, yes, you as my co-host again. All right. Thank you very so, much, Linda. Thank you. It's a yeah. pleasure. So, You're very welcome. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. So we would also would like to thank again our attendees. And so actually, some here are parents. Uh, they, they attend with their kids um, in today's session. Just an announcement to everyone who's attended the session, please do not forget the next activities lined up for you. Um, your attendance is a must. You are being checked by the teachers in charge. Um, but okay, we hope that you are enjoying our Educational Fair Conference 2022, ladies and gents. So for now, Miss Candice and I will say bye. Bye, everybody. Bye for now. Goodbye, bye. everyone. Bye. Bye, Professor Wang, Professor yes. Yang, and Professor Miller. Bye. Okay, all right. If we have just um, a photo session, if that's okay with you. Sorry. Right. We'll sure. have a photo session. Um, I was informed by the committee that we need to have a documentation. So if, if this oh, okay. is all right for the three of you. Right. Is all right. Okay. Um, Mr. Jun, you would like to join us as well. Uh, by the way, Mr. Jun is our computer science teacher at PBS Bandung. Hello, sir. Hello, nice meeting all of you. <laughs> okay, right. So I will do the screenshot. All right. If um, everyone will be uh, um, comfortable. Okay, right. So I'll count one, two, three. One, two, three. Hold it. Smile. Okay, let's check that. Okay, I think that's all right. And thanks very much. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much again, Professor. Thank you, Dr. everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Nice to meet you. Bye, bye. Bye. I hope to see you again next educational fair. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Mr. Ganes and Mr. Ganes and Professor Lim. Uh, Mr. Ganes, can you hear me? Yes, Lauren Claire. Can you hear me? Yes, Lauren Claire. Uh, okay. Can you put the top stage first? Mm -hmm. Sorry? What's that? Yeah, never mind, never mind. It's okay. So we'll just wait for the queue from the host to start. Hi, Miss Christine, are you there? Yes. All, all good to go? Good to go. We still have um, Mr. Benedictus. He is not in the room yet. Good morning, Mr. Benedicts. Hi, good morning. Can you how, hear me well? is it? how should we call you Mr. Benedictus or Mr. Alvin? Or you can just call me Ben. Oh, Ben. All right. Got it. Thank you. Can you hear me well or like yes. too low? We can hear you well. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, so now we're is Mr. Gannis. And a good question before we start the webinar. So I have, I might have some slides to share with the students to visualize what I'm talking. Is it okay to share my screen? Sure, share okay. screen. You can totally share screen with the students to inform them um, the information you have. Great. Uh, you. Professor Lin, how is your mic? Um, is it? Sorry, I did not catch you clearly. Oh, can you hear us clear? Yeah, no, it's okay. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Okay, we are just waiting on Mr. Gunness to come back, join us back, and then we will start our session today. Yes, Mr. Um, Alex was mentioning about this new function for Zoom. It's <laughs> it's a backstage thing, right? So kind of... Yeah, there is a backstage. <laughs> and even when the students register, they have this uh, ticket issues for the event. Mm -hmm. So it's quite fancy. It's really amazing. Uh -huh. and, yeah, hello, Professor Lin and hello, Ben. Uh, I am Alex from University of Sydney. I am based locally in Vietnam. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Okay. It's with the, help of, with the help of technology, we are all in the same Zoom and- Right. <laughs> so great. Um,
Okay, our participants are coming in at 154 right now. Uh, I'm just going to quickly check uh, if Mr. Um, Gannis is facing any Wi-Fi issue. All right, I'm back. Uh, I was trying to figure out what happened with our um, other uh, moderator, but I think that he will join us in a, a short while. But since we already have our participants at 164 and we are about 10 minutes uh, into our session, we'll just go ahead and start. Good morning, good morning um, to all the Bina Bangsa students and teachers. Good morning to uh, Professor Lin, Mr. Alex, Mr. Ben. Welcome, welcome to our session today. Uh, we are here to 
have this special session for um, students to know more about careers in engineering. And before we start, let me uh, introduce our panelists today. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Ben uh, representing the University of Hong Kong. He is a graduate of Binabangsa School, who is a final year student at Hong Kong University for the Bachelor of Engineering in Computer Science. Welcome and good morning. Hello, welcome, thank you. And we have Professor Lin, he is the Associate Dean and Chairman of Interdisciplinary Program of Engineering at National Tsinghua University. Welcome, Mr. Lin. Hi, I'm glad to be in this event. Oh, nice to meet you. Thank you, thank you for coming. And we have uh, Mr. Alex, he is representing the University of Sydney and he is the country manager for Vietnam. Welcome, Mr. Alex. Thank you for having me here today. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and talk about engineering careers. We are so excited to hear more about uh, engineering from all of you and good morning, Mr. Guinness. That's the last uh, panelist, right? I'm so sorry I left you hanging. Uh, my partner in crime, uh, Ms. Christine, uh, had some trouble with the internet just now. All right, glad, glad you made it back and welcome. Um, now, um, before our first question, uh, would you um, introduce um, our session a little bit, Mr. Gennis? Yeah, sure. So um, on a daily basis, when we talk about engineering, or uh, everyone would just, uh, encounter uh, the work of engineers, whether it's commuting to work, playing games on your computer, um, heating up like leftover in a microwave or even sorting, recycling. Uh, engineers have this uh, hand in our day-to-day -day activities as their knowledge can be applied in a myriad of ways, right? So this live panel today is supposed to uh, delve a bit uh, and explore into what engineers do, as well as the types of engineering jobs There's quite a variety of it. Um, everything from nuclear en uh, engineers to uh, uh, civic engineers, right? So, and the skills needed to be a successful one. So shall we start with the question for the panelists? So we'll start off with the first question for the panelists. Uh, let's take a look at the different uh, engineering spe uh, specification areas that we have. I would like to direct the question to uh, Mr. Benedictus. Hi, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Is it low? Yes, a lot of it. Okay, great. So there's a lot of engineering specifications, but if but I can only talk for HKU directly. So at HKU, we have um, civil engineering, computer science. These two are the most popular ones. And then computer engineering, electrical engineering, electronic engineering, industrial engineering, and mechanical engineering. And um, those are the more traditional engineering disciplines, but the, there's been new ones like engineering science, biomedical engineering, data science, and financial technology fintech. All right, thank you, Mr. Benedictus. Uh, how about Mr. Alex? Would you like to add on to what yeah, thank you. So I totally agree with uh, Ben on that. And I would like to share my screen to actually visualize something I have prepared for the students to see. So I think, so I think uh, Professor Lin and Ben also agree with me that there are so, so many different uh, specifications, uh, area of studies under engineering. And from Australia perspective, we actually, um, categorize us into different streams, which is like those are the most popular one for international students, including aeronautical engineering, civil engineering, biomedical, mechanical, electrical, chemical and biomolecular, and software and space as well. And if you have to look at these slides, you can see under these streams, there are so many different, um, I would say, specifications. The student can combine the mainstream, let's say civil engineering with one other specifications here as well to actually broaden their knowledge. And some other thing that I also agree with Ben is that there's so many new um, kind of career in engineering. And I recently found out that we have the humanitarian engineering as well. There's, there's the application of engineering that have people who are living in the, like disadvantaged communities is something very meaningful for human beings. 
but these are the one of the most popular engine wheel uh, streams in Australia at the moment. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Alex. So maybe we can invite um, Professor Lin for the next question. Uh, what are the most popular engineering specification nowadays? All right, if you say most popular, I would say that uh, something in the double E, well, computer science, something like that. Uh, I think it's happening in all around the world. Can you hear me clearly? It's okay? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I think that is, I suppose it's happening in all around the world. Uh, but, so in Taiwan, actually, Taiwan is a very strong semiconductor institute, as you all know that. Oh, I, I think that. And so that uh, most of the engineering graduates, including WE, computer science, and, and, and all other areas of engineering students, they went into, they go into the semiconductor industry. Oh. But in Taiwan, we actually, when we talk about higher education, whether undergraduate or graduate school, we separate, actually, WE and engineering. Oh, I mean, so if you apply, actually, they belong to two different colleges. One is a WE, WE and a computer science. The other is engineering, oh, okay? And so WE and, and computer science, as you know that, is from the title. And for engineering, we have more, I mean, say like uh, uh, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, and uh, material science and engineering and industrial engineering or maybe biomedical engineering, something like that, oh, okay? And so, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Uh, Professor Lin for the informative uh, ideas for our students to hear more about engineering. And um, I think that from our students' perspective, um, it's still not that specific of like what type of engineering they are so interested in more or less just the more obvious like electrical engineering or like civil engineer like all those um more common ones but like uh, it really is eye-opening for our students to see that when we come to the um, areas of engineering there are so many different specifications for them and so i have this uh, next question uh, why do you think our students should choose a career in engineering um I, I would I would go uh, ask uh, Professor Lin first because I see that he has many many years in this area. Uh, would you uh, share with us your experience? Why do you think uh, a student should choose a career in engineering, Professor Lin? Okay, actually, I I remember when I was uh, in high uh, in high school. Actually, I wanted to be a physicist, mm. but then because the entrance exam, I got admitted to double E, all right? So now that, that's when the old time, then when the what information wasn't so, so what, well spread. So I just choose that. Oh, but anyway, I seen it in high school, probably you are more familiar with basic science. Oh, so what is the difference between basic science and engineering? Oh, all right, I think that's probably still the one know. Basic science, you probably basically want to explore the basic, the principles and you don't care that much about the application. But engineering more focuses more on the application side. So maybe you are not so familiar with that. Maybe you don't quite understand so well about the basic principles. But I mean, if you are interested in more the application side, I would say you can choose engineering. Of course, I'm not talking about, I mean, social science and other things. I'm just saying that if you are interested in natural science and their applications, and then if you are more interested in the fundamental principles and uh, how they come, why they behave this way, then maybe then you can go for the science, I mean, science college of college of science. But if you are more interested in applications, how can they be used? And then how can, I mean, for practical things, then I would say you are suitable, you are suited for engineering study and for future engineering career, okay? Okay, thank you, Professor Lin. Uh, and for Mr. Alex, for our young minds, they are so curious about all different things and why should we direct them to the uh, career of engineering? Would you like to share with us? 
Okay, yeah, thank you. So I totally agree with Professor Lin, but I also would like to add some actually some stats for Australian side. So the Australian government did some research about the career in the future, and they found out that 75% of the fastest growing occupations require STEM or technology skills, which is directly related to engineering skills, right? From modern transportation to medicines, or even Wi-Fi we're using at the moment, or smartphone we're using every day, they're all uh, created thanks to the STEM and technology, uh, yeah. And STEM education or engineering uh, actually can be applied to different industries, not, not, not just on uh, technology, but also let's say education or health or medicine, or even financial and insurance services as well. And the starting salary for engineering graduates is quite amazing. From Australia side, the graduate salary is about 60,000 Aussie dollars per year. So this is quite amazing for students with engineering skills. Uh, I'm sure that the when the students hear the numbers, they are also excited. <laughs> but um, as a student perspective, uh, Mr. Benz, are in the uh, learning of uh, the engineering career. Um, what about you? How how did you decide to choose this um, profession for being an engineer? I think if you as Professor Lin. And Mr. Alex said, I think if you like problem solving, if you like building things, then engineering is the right choice for you. Because there's only so much we can do with principles, right? Let's say you have a principle for aerodynamics, how do you translate that and make a drone? If you like sort of challenge, I think that's engineering is right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. So, uh, speaking of basically the kind of jobs uh, they were mentioning just now, uh, and you don't necessarily have to have uh, the basic uh, grasp of sciences, more towards the applied um, version of uh, engineering. Um, how about careers in engineering that are in demand right now? I think Mr. Alex mentioned a few. Um, maybe we can have uh, Professor Lin's thoughts on it as well. Uh, careers in engineering that is in demand right now. Okay, I, I think Taiwan is trying to well, all sort of, uh, we, we want to be a high-tech country and uh, so-called high-tech island. I think you are all aware of TSMC, all right? TSMC is a leading, one of the leading companies in the semiconductor industry. And I think that uh, in Taiwan, probably the best job perspective for whether undergraduate or graduate students is actually, I mean, engineering. Uh, and of course, that medical and for being doctors, but that is a totally different thing. I mean, if we don't talk about the med medical thing, being a doctor or medical doctor and, and that kind of thing, I think engineering probably is the most, uh, I mean, probably the, the, the one that gives you the highest income in Taiwan, I mean, in addition to the medical doctors. And uh, and for and, and also in Taiwan, it's, uh, if you graduated from a well-renowned university, or and, and with a higher degree or and, and master or even PhD degree. Basically, you can probably get a very good income or, I mean, for, for in, in consideration of the living standard in, in Taiwan. And uh, for the engineer, different engineering disciplines that I just mentioned with the double computer science and also others, I think basically our students, oh, they, they actually made a good living. Oh, so I think engineering in Taiwan actually has very good, I mean, prospect. Uh, oh, okay. All right, thank you, Professor Lin. Uh, how about maybe the same question, pose it to Mr. Benedictus uh, on the careers uh, in engineering that is in demand right now. And do you see well, a trend? Sorry. What I can say about HKU is that right now the most in-demand uh, majors are computer science, definitely, and data science and civil engineering. But there are also like other trendy stuff like biomedical engineering, right, and fintech that it includes into that sort of thing. I think it's worth taking a look at. All right. Uh, how about uh, Mr. Alex? Do you see a trend in the future? Yes, I totally oh. agree with Ben that computer science is actually one of the fastest growing um, area in engineering and computer science side. And I actually have a slide to share, if you allow me to share the slide. Like, 
Okay, more so, than happy to. <laughs> yeah, from Australia side, I would usually say, um, I tell my students like you can actually combine what you love with what society needs. For example, you love computer science, right? And also, computer science is something applicable for almost all industries. So you can combine with another major to actually broaden your career opportunity. For example, you can buy software development major with music major. It's just different. It actually is applicable. Who knows that you can work for Spotify or Apple Music in the future, or you can apply computer science with, let's say, linguistics major, and you work for Google Translate. So what I say is like. Computer science is something really popular around the world, and you can actually combine that with one other major to apply the knowledge into industry and yeah, in, like raise your career outcome in the future. This is something I recommend my students to just study in Australia. Thank you, Mr. Alex. It's uh, when we see it with the different um, combinations, it gives a very visual idea for our students. Like if. They are good at some uh, this area. Then they are interested in engineer. Maybe the possibilities of um, the future careers that they can pursue. Um, I would like to ask, um, what do you think are the basic requirements for the students that want to enter the um, different areas for engineering? Like um, for them, maybe like a very specific uh, type of engineering is still a bit far for them. But at least like if they are interested in engineering, they want to pursue in the future, what are those basic requirements for our students? Um, let's hear from Professor Lin. Seems I need to answer the question first. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I would say that basically, uh, if you like, uh, we, we, we talk about, we just think about some three basic courses that uh, may be physics, chemistry, and math. So, I mean, if you feel comfortable with all these three courses in high school, I think you can go for pursue engineering career. Oh, okay, so I think, and if you hate one of that, for example, when I was a high school, in high school, I really, I truly speaking, I don't, I did not like chemistry. So I pick up like more physics oriented and math or, or, or oriented or something like that. And so that's why if you, if you don't like uh, chemistry, then you can choose maybe double E and other things that doesn't need chemistry so much. And if you, if you feel like, okay, chemistry is fine, then you can choose chemical engineering and, and also other field that, that or even biomedical engineering, something like that. So I would say that if you are, can handle math, physics, chemistry, not all of them, probably one, even one or, or two of them. And I can, I see you can choose engineering as your career. Oh, okay. Thank you, Professor Lin. What about Alex? What do you think the students should have? Well, I totally agree with Professor Lin. Um, and I could also add one more point. So students, most of students nowadays, in, even in high school, they love to do engineer, but they don't know what type of engineer they want to be in the future. So there are some certain university around the world that allow students to do the flexible first year, which means like they don't need to declare the major first. They just study the basic knowledge of engineering, at the, um, let's say basic mathematics, advanced mathematics, for example, and then get into the second year, they can declare they want to do civil engineering or electrical engineering or something like that. Yeah, back to Professor Lin's point, I would love students to have the knowledge in science in general first, let's say chemistry, biology, mathematics, physics, for example. And if you don't like either uh, any, anything of that, you can skip that and focus on the rest to maximize your GPA first and then get to success in the future in the second year with the flexible first year. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for uh, Mr. Ben, since you are still in the universities, um, tell us more about, like, you have so many classes for uh, math or physics or um, chemistry or how is it for you? What what was the most important things uh, you would tell our students if they are preparing for um, entering the university for engineers? I think the most important thing is just to, I know it's cliche, but believe in yourself and you know be brave because you will stumble at times and you will fall, but you just have to get back up again. So like, uh, is it true that they have to study so many different types of physics? Well, that, I think that really depends on the major you choose in the end. Like with, as with Mr. Alex said, in HQ, we do the same thing. Year, 
for all engineering programs, year one is a common year. And then you declare at the end of year one, whether you're gonna see the computer science for year two or civil or computer engineering. So for year one, you get a taste of everything. You get a physics, you get a taste of physics, mechanical and programming. And then at the end of year one, you're like, hey, I like more, so let me go to mechanical. I like more, so let me go to computer science. I see. So the students do have some freedom to explore more for their first year, and then they decide, okay, maybe very after engineering, I can handle more for this um, specific subjects. Then they can pursue in that trend. Is it? Yes, that applies for all the engineering programs except three, which you have to commit from year one, which is biomedical engineering, data science, and fintech. At HU for these three subjects you have to choose from your one like there's no common year but for everything else civil theater electrical industrial mechanical your one is all the same for everyone thank you so much for the information it's really helpful for our students um thank you yes christine if i were to t turn the tables around and ask you a question uh -huh. which type of uh, engineering would you choose for me yeah <laughs> If I had another chance to choose yeah. my major, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, I see a lot of students uh, that I ask, they want to go into computer science because like the use of computer is so uh, wide and in pretty much every area and every um, career now. And so that's what I see all our students are moving into. Um, but I want to hear like uh, if our students have some um, questions our panelists today. Um, for our students, if you have any questions, feel free to um, type in your questions and then we will ask our panelists for you. Okay, students, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type your questions. Okay. And so while waiting for the students to type their question, maybe uh, a bit on uh, licensing. Uh, we have heard that uh, about we need a license as an engineer. Uh, could you share us a bit about that? Um, yes, Mr. Alex. Yeah, thank you. So from Australia side, we actually required a graduate to have the license uh, to work as an engineer in Australia. So after graduate from either a bachelor degree or master degree in engineering, you have the accreditation from Engineer Australia. And with that accreditation, you can be working as an engineer and gain the salary of an engineer instead of like an assistant or a scientist in the school. So how to obtain that uh, kind of license? You just need to graduate from a degree that which is accredited by the Engineering Society of Australia Society. All right, thank you. Mr. Alex, uh, maybe Mr. Benedict regarding the licensing part. Uh, for HKU, I agree with Mr. Alex. It's basically the same thing because all of our programs are accredited by the Hong Kong Institute of Engineers. So as long as you graduate, you automatically get the license. And another question, I'm so sorry for to get up. Another question that's usually asked is not like, if I graduate from, let's say, in Australia or Hong Kong, can I work into another country, for example? And I believe that, um, let's say, accreditation from big um, countries, uh, advanced countries like um, Australia and Hong Kong, we can actually go around the world and work anywhere quite easily as well. And oh, that's great to hear. Do you agree with that? Or do you have anything to add? Uh, Maybe uh, oh. so, um, I think I would say the same for Hong um, licenses for engineers. They're quite powerful in the sense that you can just you can work in the UK, you can work in many countries. So uh, how about like when we talk about uh, do we have a license after finishing a bachelor's degree or uh, do we need to continue to master's to get one? Uh, or is that specific to where you're studying? Maybe uh, still on Mr. Benedictus, who's working from Bali by the looks of it. <laughs> no, I'm working in HKU. It's just an outdoor space. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Just kidding, I'm just kidding. We have a term here called uh, W H uh, W F B. Yeah, work from Bali. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, go on. And Sorry. for engineering at HKU, you will get a license if you graduate, undergraduate, you know. But then you, there's also the option of continuing for masters, and then you get 
like an ocean, which secures you higher pay grade as a chartered engineer or something like that. I forgot. Um, but then I'm not entirely sure which programs are covered by the Hong Kong Institute of Engineers because there's a lot of rules, right? And even in Australia, there's a lot of, you know, as well. I'm not even completely sure whether computer science is going to get a license or not. What I'm sure is civil engineering, definitely. And you must have a license to operate as a civil engineer. But I think for computer science, there isn't or there is a license. Not sure. uh, yes, uh, maybe Doc, uh, Professor Lin, any thoughts on that when it comes to licensing? OK. and. Actually, and first, that, uh, that the situation in Taiwan is that for engineering students, if you only have a bachelor degree, basically you, you can find a job, but the payment and the future de development is not so good. So therefore, most students, they will go, I mean, go into the graduate school and, and attend a master degree. And uh, after getting a master degree, but so for the requirement of uh, obtaining a, a master's degree, students are required to finish some thesis work. So basically, we focus more on the thesis and, and other trainings. Uh, then once after they finish this, actually, it's kind of guaranteed a training. So therefore, we don't have other requirements for like licensing and all other things. And also, Taiwan uh, high-tech companies, they, they also don't require that. They only will look at that where you graduated, what, what courses did you take, and also what kind of thesis and what kind of training do you have. So basically, once they look at that, they know that how good you are based on their previous experience. So basically, we don't focus on this licensing. But of course, for, for very some specific jobs, you, you probably need that for, say, for example, safety or other things. But basically, high tech industry, they don't need that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Lin. So would you like to add anything, Mr. Alex? Well, um, in Australia, it's a bit different. So each kind of the professional career requires um, an accreditation or license to, to work and to obtain the, the salary and the kind of area. Please allow me to share my screen again so I can visualize the, the license. So there we go. I hope you can see my screen already. Yep, we can see it. Yeah, so for engineering, uh, we got the accreditation from the Engineering Australia, which is like the, the, the society that focuses on engineering. And for those students who want to do computer science and graduate with computer science degree, we have the Australian Computer Society to, 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 to accredit those degrees as well. And for those who, let's say, uh, want to do in project management, is also a branch in engineering, we have the Project Management Institute, uh, as an agency of the Australian government to accredit those degree as well. So basically, in Australia, we have different profession degree in Korea, uh, in engineering career may have the accreditation, accreditation requirements to work in Australia as a professional. And uh, I, yeah, I would also like to add a little bit about, yeah, to become an engineer, uh, options to become an engineer, what to study. I totally agree with uh, Ben and Professor Lin on this. So we have two options. First, you can actually get into the Bachelor of Engineering if you already love to be an engineer, you focus on to be an engineer, you take the Bachelor of Engineering honors, and after graduation, you become an engineer with the accreditation for that degree already. But if you graduate from high school and you still don't know what kind of thing I want to do, but as I know that I love science, I know that I love physics, I love chemistry, you can do a Bachelor of Science first, even double major, and after that, after some time uh, working in the industry, you want to become an engineer and they get the accredit accreditation for better salary, for example, you pursue a master degree in professional engineering for another two or three years, and you also get the accredit accreditation to be an engineer in Australia. So this is how it works in Australia side. Thank you, Mr. Alex. This is really interesting that it's kind of like if our uh, sure about engineering to start with when you entering the university, it actually saves you some time. But like, if you're not really sure to begin with, you wanted a um, different major, and then later on you decide you want to do engineering, then you have to get a master's degree and then credit it for this. Yes. I, see. Um, I, I think that uh, there are some good questions coming up in their Q&A from our students. And um, 
allow me to share this student uh, question from Sec4 Truth, uh, Michelle. Uh, she asked for biomedical engineering, can we use that degree and use it as a basis to go into the dental medical path? And the floor is open <laughs> if you have any input for her question. Yes, go Mr. Alex for the question. Well, so thank you so much for that very interesting question. Um, I would answer this question from um, the perspective of um, admission requirement. Let's say if you want to become a doctor in Australia, for example, you may need to do a doctor of medicine. And in order to get into doctor of medicine degree, you have to complete a bachelor degree first, which can, which is actually can be anything else in let's say science or even uh, business or even commerce, for example. So the degree that you like, uh, the biomedical engineering is something amazing because it's directly related to science and also health as well. So I would say you can finish your bachelor of um, biomedical engineering first and then take an exam getting to doctor of medicine to become a doctor in Australia or doctor of dental medicine to become a dentist in Australia. I would say yes to your question. Great. Uh, okay, so uh, can I? Yeah, go on, go on, Professor Lee. Yeah, I mean, in Taiwan, I mean, if you want to be a doctor, well, there are two options or two choices or two ways. Anyway, first, go into the medical school since, I mean, first year undergraduate and then after roughly, I think, suppose seven years and six years for dentists, then you can get the license and become a, a medical doctor. And if you graduate from uh, like uh, other department, then you, you have to get admitted to a different program. It's called post uh, graduate and or med medical school for for post graduate, something like that. So it has. So this is uh, another possibility. But let uh, let the number is limited, and also I suppose not for dentists, only for medical doctors of in Taiwan. Okay, so there's another question here from Stella. I think more on the motivation level. Uh, was there at any time where you felt that you wanted to quit being an engineer? So common, isn't it? <laughs> You've got to be tough as nails. Uh, if so, how did you overcome that and what made you keep going? Um, maybe we can hear from uh, Mr. Benedictus first. I think it happens to everyone, definitely. That's without question. At some point, you will feel like you're an imposter and you don't really understand what's being taught. And then your classmates are somehow understanding everything but not you. But that's just not true because I feel like everyone struggles differently in different areas on different you know, levels. And it really helps that you, you know, trust yourself and have a support system that's really, really important. Your friends that you can talk to and preferably friends in the same course as you and you know have a good social life and you know you just you just have to go through it you know same like university applications how did you go through with it you just you just kind of do that's true maybe stella yeah, has been friends, watching a lot of but in the end you have to do it sorry that's a little black maybe stella was watching a lot of this Three Idiots by Amir Khan, where the batch of engineering gets bullied by professor. <laughs> um, any thoughts on the motivation level? Yes, Mr. Alex? Well, I will say I received this question quite a lot, not just from engineering side, but also for other degree as well, other major as well. So my answer for this is that my advice for the student is that you can talk to your the one who trusts your friends your classmates or the professor that you're close to or the tutor you're close to or even your parents to share the, the, the things that you are worried, the reason why you want to quit. And of course, those, those friends or those people need to be the one you, can, you trust and also those who understand you well. And yeah, from there, you can try to get your motivation back. And also think, of, think, think about the reason why you want to be an engineer back in the day, back in the first day. So focus on that, um, I would say. It's not easy to become an engineer, but it's quite a, also it's quite a long run. But if you can focus on your study, if you can keep the motivation by, let's say, talking to those who are successful and learn from them, you'll be successful to become an engineer. Oh, very 
truly say, capture it, right? I think if you have the passion for anything, uh, you would see uh, the obstacles as opportunities and try to work things out. So um, thank you, Stella, for that question. Um, I, I, think, I think that like, from the students, it's they perceive the uh, engineering as a hard uh, major to complete, or it's like when we talk about engineering, it's like so much work, so many uh, difficult science classes, or like we have to be uh, working so hard. And so I think that from the students' perspective, they are trying to uh, find out like how much do they need to prepare themselves to invest in engineering majors um, and is it difficult to pass to complete the program or is it like a lot of the people that started uh, being interested in engineering majors but then they realize oh it's too difficult to do and then they switch to a path. So I also think that the, one of the things that the student need to prepare to be to study engineers is that you have to plan the degree carefully. Of course, when you feel like you want to quit a certain thing, this is the reason why the, the reason you want to do that is you don't know what to do. You don't know what uh, to solve the problem. So how to avoid that? Try to plan your degree carefully and try to talk to your senior students who already did that and learn how to overcome your situation. This is something you need to advise the student. Professor Lin, any thoughts uh, for the students over the years? They have a successful finish, or do you see quite a few students would not be able to handle all the tasks and hard things? In oh, oh, all right. I, I think I think that uh, in Taiwan we have a very strict like uh, admission program or that that kind of admission selection. I mean that that kind of program. So therefore. Most students coming to our university, they are sort of have been selected, kind of speaking. All right. So I mean, I would say that uh, probably ninety-five percent of students do not have problems to graduate, and probably five percent. Oh, I mean, and of course, then as the other two speaker, Alex and Benny say, then we will just try to help them. Oh, I mean, to help them overcome all these courses, and we also have student group and also professors will, will try help them. Oh. But so anyway, based on my experience, roughly 5% students have such problems. And but for foreign students, it is slightly different because that we don't have that kind of joint entrance or the kind of very carefully, I mean, well-designed selection model. So I mean, it, it is kind of, I mean, then, then the result is still kind of slightly more unpredictable. So I would say that, say, if you are interested in coming to Tsinghua University, we have some alumni here, and so probably you can contact them and then ask them about the study and whether it's difficult or not. And if the alumni tell you that, all right, it's okay, then I would say that, yeah, then just come here. You, you, you can get, I, I suppose you will be able to finish all the, the I and mean, you can get the degree here. Oh, okay. yeah, thanks. Thank you, Professor Lin. We have a very specific question from our student. Um, Davina asks, if you are taking a certain major and want to transfer to a different major halfway, how does the system for transferring the credit in classes work? Okay, uh, let me say first, I did not say talk too much about our program and all this in here. Actually, I mean, if you're interested in coming to NTAHU first, you will get one first year in the so-called IBT, it's called International Bachelor Program. And then staying in that program for one year and then taking some more general courses and then you'll be transferred to so-called interdisciplinary program of engineering and this is we have some more like an open curriculum so you can choose i mean courses from several different departments and then you can i mean choose all these courses so that means that in this program you don't have a very specific major so i mean you can just choose based on your, your need. And uh, as long as you finish the required courses, required credit, you get enough credits that you can graduate. So I would say this is has a flexible curriculum. And so if you feel that you are not so good, say you first, you want to major in say chemical engineering, but if you is so tough, then we try to switch, then you just choose different courses, then you still get the degree. So this is, a, I mean, the design of this interdisciplinary program of engineering in, at NTHU. And also I, I'm the chairman, uh, uh, as you say, 
as you know that. Oh, okay. Yeah. You found the right person to ask this question. <laughs> Mr. Alex, anything to add from the Sydney side? Yeah, I also agree with the professor on that. And from Australia side, um, my advice for students who want to transfer from a degree to another, let's say engineering, uh, is that um, you have to consider the similarity between the two programs. For example, if you are doing business and you want to transfer to engineering, so it's quite difficult because between finance, marketing, etc., and engineering is actually science. So it's a bit difficult. So you, if you do, let's say, science, bachelor of science in physics and chemistry, it's quite easy to transfer. And secondly, you need to decide when you want to transfer. Uh, halfway should be okay, but let's say in Australia, we have four-year bachelor of engineering degree. If you do that in the year three, it's quite difficult because you almost finished the degree already. The ideal time to do the transfer is in late year one or early year two. Right, so the type of transfer, the credit that you're looking for is also specific. So thank you on that. Uh, there's another question on nuclear engineering by Samantha. I would like to know if, for example, we choose nuclear engineering as the major, what will we do in the future? I'm guessing a day in life of a student, what to expect in the classes as uh, it is a major, not many people may choose. Thank you. Open to the floor. Student have an interest in knowing more about nuclear engineering as a major. Oh, okay. In, in uh, let, let me answer the question. Okay, uh, in the College of Engineering, we don't have new nuclear I mean engineering department, but there is a nuclear engineering department. Or it, it, I I would say it's an institute. Oh, but before it was focused on nuclear engineering. Oh, we have that kind of institute. Oh, all right. It's in so called co College of of what. Uh, atomic science or also yeah so i mean we have that so if the student is interested that she can apply is that she right yeah she can apply for that program and uh, basically what what the student will do because there are nuclear plants in taiwan and also actually china is uh, i mean building a lot of new nuclear plants and also probably in some other countries so i mean for students that graduate in, from this nuclear engineering department, basically the job you'll get, I would say, is a go to the nuclear plant and help with the establish, establishment or maybe disassemble a, a, a nuclear plant. Both ways are, are fine. You can find a job there. Okay. Yes, Mr. Alex. Yeah, thank I think I can answer that as well, though. Sure. Um, I think if you choose a major that's not necessarily like has very, very high demand or it's like a very small field, then as what Professor Lin said, you, you just work in the field, right? You just have to be um, aware of that information, you know? Right, we have another question from Fatima. Uh, what is the important skill you need uh, in order to become an engineer? I think uh, the panelists touched on a few skills, like problem solving, etc. Uh, any other skills other than being as hard as nails? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I think it's helpful to realize, you know, like as in everything, even play a lot takes time, right? So you might think before going to university, oh, I think engineering is for me. And then when you're in year two, you think, oh, this is too hard. I think I've misjudged. I'm an imposter. Let me switch. Let me switch to making movies. But then the same thing will happen again, you know, because it's it happens with all passions, right? You will face difficulties, and then you're like, actually, you know what? I think I just like watching movies. I can't make movies. I'm an imposter. And then you switch again. And basically, what I'm saying is, everything you like will take effort and i think that's helpful in the sense that you're not alone that you, you you didn't choose the wrong path you know and believe in yourself and don't be afraid to fall you know? that's very very important mr benedictus you summed up 
the life of an engineer very precisely, where engineers see a problem that we don't, and they solve it in a way that we cannot comprehend. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, Mr. Alex, any uh, parting advice when it comes to skills? Well, okay, so if you want to become a successful engineer, I must say right in the high school time, you need to focus on science study, just like Professor Lin uh, mentioned earlier. So I, um, for Australia side, I would say, yeah, focus on science. And also, if you have some, uh, yeah, in Australia, we also allow students to do exchange program as well. So not just focus on Australia, you can actually do an exchange program a semester in other country to see how engineer people in other countries work, study as well. We allow students to do one or two semesters in let's say the US, the UK or any part of Asia as well. So do the exchange program, broaden your knowledge and get make friends around the world. Those who are engineers in the future. Professor Lin, any advice for our students uh, to well in the engineering? Well, 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 I think I have just said, if they are comfortable with uh, three courses and then explore a little bit about the different departments and disciplines, what they plan, what they are working on. And then I would say that uh, you, you, you can get a good life in, 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 in what, in, in college, in, in, in your college life. Oh, all right. Yeah. Okay. We have uh, truly the best uh, wishes for our students if they decide to pursue an engineer major. And we have a student that's really interested in a question that's uh, more related to um, the days of uh, choices. So uh, how is the engineering career in relation to gender? Is it still a area that there are so many um, guy students or are there more uh, female students wanting to do engineering as well? I, I see Mr. Alex nodding his head. Go ahead, Mr. Alex. Well, that kind of like stereotype, I could say, is not really um, a thing anymore in Australia. So in our department, engineering department, I would say more than 30% of our engineering students are female. And especially in biomedical engineering, more than 50% of our students are female. So it's quite a, 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 an amazing balance. Um, actually, uh, I don't think um, the, 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 the saying like engineering is for male is available anymore or anywhere around the world. I can still... One of my friends are actually an engineer at Bosch, the company. So I believe that female can actually study and do very well to become a really good engineer. How about uh, Professor Lin from National Tsinghua University? How is it? Actually, I, I never thought about the gender problem. Of course, there are more male students than female students. But I mean, I, I never seen that the gender is a problem for, I mean, Female students actually they have better academic performance than male students because usually they are careful and uh, they are patient and eventually although you see that uh, engineering weather need that but actually that is a character much needed for I mean engineering career all mm -hmm. right so I would say that uh, engineering is very suitable for for female students and in taiwan here we never have a kind of gender problem it is a well probably i i i put it this way female probably have more responsibilities but i mean we don't restrict them they if they are the ability they can just develop and become i mean i mean have a develop very well in their career actually we have very, I mean, well-renowned female alumnus in our department in College of Engineering. Yeah, so I mean, don't be afraid. Yes, uh, thank you for empowering all our um, female students that are interested in this engineering. Uh, how is it like uh, for Ben from my home? I think in HKU, especially in engineering majors such as computer science and industrial engineering, yeah, I think I would say it's fairly balanced here. Yeah. It's and it's improving really, really quickly as well. The other majors, they're catching up, albeit not as quickly. The civil engineering, as expected, is a bit slower to catch up. Good to hear. Um, let's see. I think there's one more question from Valerie. Does the campus have good facilities? If you ask them now, all three will say it's perfect. So I would suggest go and look up the universities. Um, we have a lot of resources online uh, at your disposal, right? Um, so 
Uh, I think we have come to the end of our session. Um, any parting words, Ms. Christine? Um, I, I, would, I would like uh, for our panelists today to say a few words for our students as uh, um, the students that are interested in the majors. What would you say uh, to our future engineer students? Let's go with uh, Professor Lin. Okay. Well, so don't be afraid. Just go ahead. I mean, don't think about too much. Just like I say, if you can handle the basic science course as well, then just go pursue the engineering career. It's good. I like it. Yeah. And uh, oh, of course, welcome you to apply to the NTHU uh, engineering programs. Oh, welcome you very much. Okay. Thank you, Professor Lin. Alex? Well, so Professor Lin already talked about um, the, the, the motivation part, and it was like to focus on the career outcomes. So engineering is such an amazing career part for students, very rewarding, high earning, high salary in the future. So don't lose your interest. If you're doing well in science, do I want that? Focus on science and you can pursue career en engineering quite easily anywhere around the world. Mm -hmm. um, from Ben? I think what's most important is just to trust in yourself, believe in yourself, and don't doubt yourself. Because honestly, I, I also I'm supposed to be graduating now, but I took a gap here because I thought maybe computer science is not really for me. So I started making art, uh, painting, movies, and my movies got exhibited. But then I realized that, you know, hey, art isn't as easy as I thought. And same with making movies, right? And so now I'm in my last year of engineering, computer science engineering. I think that, that mindset of like, if only I choose the one right degree and all anxiety and worry will go away, I think that's an illusion. So just believe in yourself and choose your own path because no one is born innately a cellist, no one is born a pianist, no one is born you know, playing trumpets, right? In the end, you choose your own path and don't think of life is not a problem to be solved, right? It's a mystery to be experienced. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your time and inputs and the uh, knowledge to share with our students as they are interested in the uh, careers of engineer. And I think that the um, engineer field is so important for our future. You guys are changing our worlds and then uh, for our futures, engineers in the making from our students. Uh, uh, take notes from our panelists today, um, prepare your hearts, uh, ready for the work, and uh, explore, uh, know more about your interests, and then decide. And I'm sure if you have any other questions, you'll be able to find our um, um, specialists, our um, panelists to be able to um, an answer more of the questions. And thank you so much for inspiring for our students. Um, and I think that our students learned a lot about um, the careers and the majors of engineer. And I just uh, hope and encourage our students will continue to pursue their passion, their interest in engineer, and do not be afraid of uh, taking on those hard uh, science tasks in science subjects. Um, any uh, words from Mr. Gannis? No, that's about it. I think you've captured my thoughts uh, and everything. So thank you, uh, dear panelists. Thank you, students. Uh, thank you, Ms. Christine, for moderating as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great day, all. Thank you so much for joining our session today. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.
Sekolah School merupakan sekolah yang mengedepankan nilai integritas, kerjasama, passion, dedikasi, compassion, dan menginspirasi. Berdiri sejak 2003 di Kota Malang, Bina Bangsa School selalu menyuguhkan pendidikan terbaik dari Barat dan Timur. Pendidikan yang sudah diakui secara internasional itu pun selalu sukses menyediakan siswa berkompeten di abad 21 yang tetap menjunjung akar budaya bangsa. Dalam lingkungan sekolah, siswa aktif menggunakan bahasa Inggris sebagai bahasa penata utama dan bahasa Mandarin sebagai bagian program bilingual. Sebagai sekolah unggulan, Bina Bangsa School memiliki visi menjadi sekolah yang membina para pemimpin dan berusaha menjadi yang terbaik yang mereka bisa melalui pembelajaran seumur hidup berakar pada budaya kita didasarkan pada firman Tuhan. Sementara misi Bina Bangsa School yakni memampukan siswa menyadari harga diri yang jelas, menanamkan disiplin dalam pikiran yang terbuka, integritas, keuletan, dan keberanian sepanjang perjalanan belajar mereka. Bangsa School juga memiliki
Hi, Dr. Chan, Dr. Lopez. Hello. Are you able to Hello. hear us? Hello, everyone. Hi. 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 Are you ready to switch on your video? I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we will wait. Ah, we see you now. Yeah. Hi. 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 Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you. Okay. Uh, can you see this, us? Yes, we can. And we can hear you loud and clear also. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Miss Maslinda. I'm the head of department for English and Humanities. And I have a special group of uh, my task force here, uh, the student moderators. So today's session will not be uh, moderated by me, but by student moderator, uh, Miss Movivian and Mr. Rico. Okay, here. Can you say uh, hello? Hi, Dr. Lopez. Hi, Dr. Richard. Hello. 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 Where's Mervivian? Okay, hold on. Mervivian, uh, one of my co-moderator is still backstage. Hold oh. on. Okay. So, uh, these two student moderators are the ones uh, who will be talking to you, but uh, three of the students here have been working very hard also to get the script together, to get the timing right. Uh, Jason, Ishna, and Olivia. Uh, can you say hello to them? Guys, hello. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. And of course, everything is done. With all thanks to Mr. Hadi. Thank you, Mr. Hadi. Thank you, Miss Maslinda. Hello, Dr. Lopez. Hello, Dr. Chan. Hello, Hi, uh, Mr. Hadi. Nice. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So we will start with the uh, session very soon uh, and then we will all go to the backstage. I think right now as it is, uh, our audience are able to watch this little introduction uh, but we will leave uh, to start the session proper. Uh, nice to meet you and I hope that you have a meaningful uh, session very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this year's Edi Fair. Reaching out to you live from Bina Bangsa School, Pantai Indah Kapok, Jakarta. So I am Rivian, and this is Rico, my co-moderator. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Rico. So Rico, do you know anything about the hospitality industry? Um, yeah, so I'm sure that Uh, sorry for that. We're facing some technical difficulties with the webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this year's Edi Fair. Reaching out to you live from Binabangsa School, Pantai Indah Kapuk, Jakarta. I'm Marivian, and this is Rico, my co-moderator. Greetings, everyone. My name is Rico. So, Rico, do you know anything about the hospitality industry? Um, I'm sure that everyone here knows a little bit about the hospitality industry. I'm sure we've all been to the great hotels all around the world, but I don't really know anything about the inner workings of the hospitality industry. But today at this Edu Fair, we're very lucky to have two special guests with us. Um, please give them all a warm welcome. Uh, first up, stemming from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University School of Hotel and Tourism Management, we have the esteemed Dr. Eric Chan. Dr. Chan is an associate professor at PolyU's School of Hotel and Tourism Management. 
He is an owner of a travel agency and he's also a hotel assistant manager. He specializes in hospitality facilities and management and design along with hotel operations among other things. So clearly he's a very decorated individual and it's a huge honor to have him here with us today, Dr. Chen. Next up, hailing from Ecole Hotelier de Luzon, we have Dr. Luciano Lopez. He's the Dean of EHL campus in Singapore and specializes in economics. His research focuses on the applied economics and his outstanding teaching skills were recognized with the Credit Suisse Best Teaching Award in 2016 and the EHL Best Distance Teaching Award in 2020. Welcome doctors. Hello everyone. So Dr. Eric Chan, for those who are still unsure about the career to pursue, how can they discover that hospitality industry might be for them? Oh, I see. Thank you for your question, Vivian. Uh, and thanks for, uh, for your uh, very brief K introduction. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm so glad to have this chance K, to share uh, something about uh, maybe hospitality or maybe even I mean, the study of the hospitality management K, with the students here. So uh, to answer I mean, your question uh, briefly, right? Uh, uh, what's the hospitality? Uh, I think K hospitality. I don't know whether uh, you know that or not. K hospitality actually okay, uh, comes from uh, old French word, right? Uh, hospice, right? Meaning uh, caring, uh, giving someone shelter to stay. So I believe okay, many people okay, they refer hospitality management to uh, hotel management. Okay, this is uh, what I think. But uh, I think okay, hospitality management is uh, much more than uh, hotel management, right? Even though hotel management is still, I mean, the primary career option okay, for those uh, uh, people with uh, hospitality education. Okay, but studying hospitality management can uh, take people uh, into, uh, for instance, okay, uh, entrepreneurship, events, marketing, sustainability, HR, and many other rewarding disciplines. Okay, for instance, okay, my wife, okay, yeah, uh, who uh, studied I mean, the hospitality management before, okay, also in our school here in Hong Kong, right? And after the graduation, uh, she joined I mean, the hotel industry as a uh, HR, uh, and eventually a HR director of a hotel. But later on, okay, uh, she could change okay, to other fields. Okay, for instance, now uh, she's I mean uh, the uh, head of HR of uh, a luxury jewelry shop, right uh, here in Hong Kong. Uh, so uh, if you like, okay, if you look, I mean hospitality, okay, I believe okay, it's more than the hotels, right? More than the hotel management, right? Uh, under this hospitality, uh, we can have I mean different sectors there. Okay, for instance, hotel, events, uh, 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 convention, if you like, right? Uh, casino, uh, uh, many, okay? Air, cruise lines, theme parks, okay, attractions, okay, many, okay, will be included. Okay, this is uh, what I'd like to share today about the meaning of hospitality. That's a very great answer, very insightful. I didn't know the hospitality industry is actually that. Um, but how about you, Dr. Lopez? What do you think are the things a student can consider for the hospitality industry? Well, I, I fully align with uh, what Dr. Chan just uh, shared. Uh, just to give you an example, at EHL, our alumni or our graduates end up, only 50% of them end up in the hospitality in the sense hotel industry. The remaining 50%, well, can, can end up in any industry where there is a service. Because as, as Dr. Chan mentioned, a ser uh, hospitality is a human-centric approach. So whenever you offer a service, th there is this human-centric approach. And um, it is true that for, for <laughs> exactly the reasons explained by Dr. Chan, uh, we associate hospitality with hotels, but this has to change because it's, it's related to the service. It's related to make ensure you offer a human experience that is uh, outstanding. This is the hospitality industry for me. Okay, so for perhaps 
uh, those who are trying to pursue a career in hospitality industry, do you have any advice to them? You, you, it's my turn still, yeah? You can go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I have an advice. The advice is the following. While you study uh, in any hospitality school, can be HL, can be something, another school, Hong Kong, etc. Um, please make sure that while you study, you get to know industry leaders. You approach industry leaders. You you go for internships. Can be a short one. Uh, can be two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. But just make sure while you study, you know where you want to work because again, hospitality is a vast domain. You can be uh, front desk in a hotel. You can be working for a bank, uh, you can be managing uh, uh, a branch of a car industry. So I will say my advice is keep your mind open um, and make sure to go meet the industry leaders, go for internships, even short ones, so that you know exactly what you want to do later. Don't wait until the end of the studies because otherwise you will lose that opportunity to really ask the questions in class that relate to what you want to do. So my advice is again, uh, please take your time when, when you study to get to know all the sectors you can end up. Uh, great answer. So following up on that little discussion we have about internships, um, I was wondering what are the internet opportunities for a hospitality student? Like, um, are there certain companies that you can go to work at? Um, can you? do the internship abroad, uh, maybe Dr. Chan can answer this question. Okay, sure, uh, Rico, thank you uh, for your questions. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Lopez K, uh, about what I mean, uh, he just mentioned, okay, about the placement, the work experience. Okay, I thought, I mean, this is very important, okay, for our industry, hospitality industry, or the so-called like, service industry, right? So, uh, for instance, okay, for our students, okay, uh, after admission, right, uh, all the students here, okay, taking our program, taking our majors, they, they are required to uh, complete uh, six months, right, or 960 hours okay, of cumulative work experience, right, in order to fulfill uh, the so-called work integrated education, okay, we have a special term for this placement, okay, we call it as a work integrated education, right, so during this uh, uh, work integrated education, our students, okay, they will be placed at, uh, at uh, some leading hotels, okay, restaurant change, okay, uh, or maybe other tours, some and events, okay, organizations uh, in Hong Kong or maybe abroad, okay, overseas, okay, uh, for the work placement. Okay, so for this placement, definitely, okay, uh, the student, they will have a chance, okay, to, number one, okay, to uh, gain, I mean, the practical experience. Okay, I think this is very important. Right, because our industry, hospitality industry, hotel industry, or even other, uh, like, I mean, uh, events, okay, or maybe uh, 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 the tourism industry, uh, uh, I mean, the work experience okay, is a very, very important. And that's why before graduation, okay, we need our student, right, to have, I mean, all this hand-on experience, okay, through uh, undertaking, I mean, the, uh, the uh, work integrated education, right? So definitely, okay, they can gain, I mean, those practical experience, okay, during the program. And at the same time, uh, uh, through the internship, right, those students, okay, they, they can apply what, all right, they learn uh, in the classroom, like, I mean, theories, okay, uh, different concepts, whatever, okay. So in the placement, they can apply, okay, what they have learned in the classroom, okay, while working in the industry, right. At the same time, uh, uh, one thing I think uh, very important, okay, in the placement, they will have a chance, okay, to develop the people skills, right? Uh, 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 while working in the hotel or with other tourism and US organizations, uh, because, okay, you know, that means our industry, uh, in fact, okay, is a people industry, right? Uh, when uh, entering I mean, industry, definitely we have to deal with uh, people, okay, different types of people, okay? Our time after the placement, right? Uh, student, they can also apply uh, their experience in the internship, right, to the studies, okay, because in our school, uh, our students can normally, they will go out uh, to undertake, I mean, the placement, uh, 
uh, either in year two or year three. Okay, so in other words, that means they after the placement, they have to come back, right, and finish I mean, the final year studies here, okay, in Hong Kong. So, I mean, their experience okay, in placement, okay, in internship, okay, in fact, okay, is very, very important, very useful uh, for their studies. For instance, okay, uh, uh, let's say uh, in examination, Right, students, okay, they like examination, right? <laughs> in examination, okay, they may use, uh, I mean, the experience, right, in internship, right, and as example, right, to answer, I mean, those questions, right? So uh, I think, I mean, that's why, I mean, uh, uh, the placement opportunities definitely okay, is a very, very important uh, for those students, okay, taking the hospitality degree or the tourism degree. Okay, this is what I feel. Thank you, Rico. So thank you, Dr. Eric, for the very marvelous answer. Mm -hmm. So for the curious students here, um, can we, can you tell us uh, what can a hospitality student expect their life to be like? What are the courses and lessons that they have to take? Oh, okay. Uh, you mean uh, the courses offered by our school, right? Okay, so in brief, okay, because uh, in fact, okay, there are many different subjects, okay, all together, uh, if I'm correct, okay, we have over uh, 40 subjects, okay, for our student to complete uh, in order to graduate. Uh, so uh, here I, I cannot explain all, or right, one by one in detail, but in brief, okay, in our course, uh, uh, the title of a course is uh, 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 Hotel and Tourism Management, right? We have this uh, special scheme, but under this scheme, right, we have three different specialisms, okay, for students to select, right, in their year two. So the first one, the first uh, specialism is the hotel management, hotel management. Okay, the second uh, specialism is uh, the smart tourism and hospitality. Okay, something about the IT technology, right? And then the third specialism uh, is uh, the event, and experience management specialism. Okay, so in year two, uh, after the first year study, all right, students uh, 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 have many more uh, uh, ideas or more knowledge okay, uh, about what okay, their main career interest. So in year two, they will follow, I mean, their interest okay, to select one specialism to study. So for instance, if a student uh, selecting a hotel management specialism to study, Right. Uh, in addition to those common subjects, uh, the students uh, need to study some specialist subject. Okay, in hotel management, for instance, the hotel operation, uh, resort management, uh, some uh, uh, food and beverage courses. Okay, at different levels, and uh, we have revenue management for student study, uh, hospitality assets management. Okay, so this is I mean specialist subject for the hotel management student, and for the uh, students taking the smart, okay, smart tourism and hospitality, then they need to start, uh, study uh, some subjects like, I mean, the uh, the uh, uh, the tourism and hospitality uh, management information system. Okay, they need to study AI, artificial intelligence in tourism and hospitality and event, and they need to study social media and digital marketing analytics. Okay, something like this. Of course, okay, they also need to study smart surface design, right, in our industry. And for those, okay, selecting the event and experience management specialism, then this group of students, okay, they will have a chance okay, to study uh, uh, subjects, okay, like uh, the event management, right, meeting management, uh, uh, experience mapping, right, in hospitality, tourism, and event. And then uh, we also have a subject, okay, uh, something about, I mean, the luxury management, okay, the luxury management, right? Uh, so, I mean, this is, I mean, uh, those specialist subjects, okay, uh, students need to take, okay, under different specialism. But of, but, uh, of course, okay, uh, uh, we have some, uh, the so-called uh, common subjects, okay, for the student study, okay? In other words, that means, okay, these common subjects, all right, no matter what specialty, uh, specialism a student uh, select okay, to study, okay, they must study, okay, these common subjects. I can give you one example, right, for instance, the human resources management, okay, in hospitality, tourism, in event, 
Okay, this is much key for all the students. Okay, to study, uh, we have uh, uh, technology, right? Technology strategy, right? In hospitality and tourism and event. Okay, this is for all the students to study. And uh, at the same time, we also have, I mean, uh, the uh, strategic management, strategic management, right? In hospitality and tourism event, right? Uh, this is for all the students to study. So in other words, that means, okay, uh, there's, uh, if you like, okay, there are three main types okay, of subjects. Okay, our students here in Hong Kong, okay, they need to study. The first one is the specialist subject, okay, under different specialism, okay. And the second type is the common subjects, okay, uh, for instance, the HR of resources, right. And the third one, uh, we have also have about 10 subjects, okay, uh, uh, this type of subject, okay, they are required by PolyU, okay, by Hong Kong PolyU, right? All the students here in Hong Kong, okay, at Hong Kong PolyU, okay, they need to complete all these, the so-called uh, university general requirement subjects, okay? For instance, uh, we have subjects uh, like, I mean, uh, the uh, surface learning, okay, to serve the community, right? We have subjects about the, the history, right, uh, in China, okay, something like this. Uh, we have some uh, cultural study. Okay, so this is uh, the so-called university requirement or uh, subjects. Okay, so in brief case, okay, there's uh, three main types okay, of the subjects here in the program. Okay, I hope I can answer your question. Um, Vivian? Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, but before we move on, um, could we also ask Dr. Lopez to share about DHL, what are the courses it has to offer, what are the training experiences like, and we even heard that there's a Michelin star restaurant at the DHL's campus, so could you share more about that? Yes, of course. Um, so, EHL, if we focus on the bachelor, uh, it's a bachelor in international hospitality management. And to summarize, what we do at EHL is to educate future business women and businessmen. It can be in any service industry. However, our DNA at EHL is indeed um, hotels, which means that during the preparatory year before the bachelor, because we ask students to have past experience, past internship experience, and if you don't have that past experience, then you are asked to do the preparatory year in Lausanne, our, home camp our main campus in, in Switzerland, and there you learn all the um, jobs that you you may see in a hotel like front desk like a uh, room uh, service uh, cooking etc etc and it's also very important for us to 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 make sure that the students know all this so that they have the soft skills and the the understanding of the company because when you become a manager it is essential that you know all the jobs within your your company so we use the hospitality industry the hotel industry to, to, to showcase uh, what it means to be a businesswoman or a businessman in the service industry. But as I shared earlier, only 50% of our students end up in the hotel industry. 50% end up in the banking industry, in the capital industry, in the car mm -hmm. industry, in the luxury industry. So it's really a, a wide range of jobs that we, we open up thanks to the fact that we actually the name of EHL, the name of EHL is EHL Hospitality Business School, which means that we train our students to be businessmen and businesswomen. We showcase the hospitality industry uh, because it's our DNA, as you all know. However, we make sure that all our students are educated enough and well to be managers in other industries. And to answer your question, because you mentioned the BDS restaurant, in Lausanne, well, to showcase the jobs that we have in the hotel, we do it in EHL standards, which means that we have indeed a one Michelin star restaurant on our campus in, in Switzerland. Um, the chefs with uh, whom you will be working during the preparatory year are famous chefs uh, with, uh, with a great recognition, inter international recognition. And once you are done with the preparatory year, then you start the so-called bachelor degree. And the bachelor degree, as I said, is to make sure that you are a businesswoman and businessman. And 
uh, a question that I, I receive from time to time is how do you make sure you, you teach the most relevant or the most updated topics? Well, we have one full semester, the last semester, where we have what we call electives. So the students decide what they want to, uh, to, to, to follow. And in those electives, we offer, of course, topics, uh, very hot topics like sustainability, like uh, Dr. Chan was mentioning, uh, how to work with IT in the service industry or the hospitality industry, uh, how to work with tech, you know that, or you may see that in some hotels or places, some robots, how do you interact with the robots, etc., etc. So we make sure to have, to give the students the most updated skills so that after the, 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 the studies at EHL, they are ready to go and uh, to take on, uh, I will say, mid-level mid uh, positions like managers. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. That was very, mm -hmm. um, that was very useful. Um, so the next question we have is for Dr. Chan. So what is the most important thing that you should know about the industry before uh, joining the industry itself? Like, do you have any tips for them also? <laughs> uh, uh, this is not an easy uh, uh, question to answer. But before uh, joining uh, the industry or before taking uh, the hospitality management course, right, this program, right, I think, I mean, uh, students, okay, you have uh, uh, many different considerations, okay, and that's why, uh, Vivian, okay, you have such a question, right? So I think, okay, before uh, joining the industry or maybe uh, picking a hospitality management course okay, to study, uh, I believe okay, it's very, very important okay, for a student uh, to understand uh, the, the main or the basic characteristics okay, of uh, our industry. You know, our industry, uh, let me see, okay. Uh, let's say, okay, if you take any hospitality industry, okay, as a sample, or maybe the hotel industry as a sample, right? Uh, you know that our industry, uh, the hospital business okay, are open 365 days a year, long stop, 24 hours a day, long stop. Okay, so please okay, imagine, okay, as a hotel worker, okay, employees, okay, uh, uh, it seems, okay, uh, uh, there's so much to do, right? And it seems, okay, uh, sometimes, okay, some employees there, they cannot have, I mean, the, uh, the public holidays, all right, to take a break, for instance. Right, and uh, because of these uh, uh, characteristics, okay, our industry, I mean the hospitality business, okay, uh, depends heavily on shift work. Okay, in other words, okay, uh, 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 people working in this industry, uh, quite often, okay, they are required to work on shift. I used to be in the hotel industry before, not long time ago, okay, before teaching. Okay, I remember, right, sometime, okay, I was assigned Okay, uh, to work in the morning, early in the morning. Okay, I have to report uh, duty uh, at seven in the morning, right? And we have morning shift, we have afternoon shift, we have evening shift. Uh, further, we have overnight, overnight shift as well. Okay, that means, okay, uh, if assigned, okay, uh, uh, we assigned, okay, to, uh, to on duty, all right, uh, on overnight shift, okay, then the employee, okay, will need to go back to the company at around 11 in the evening, all right, to work overnight until seven or eight, okay, uh, let's stay morning, okay. So this is what, okay, as a student, all right, or as a, uh, a potential employees, okay, of the industry, okay, we need to know, all right, this is, I mean, the, the characteristics, okay, of our industry, okay, number one. So do you like it? I don't know, okay, because some students, okay, some people, okay, they like office hour, nine to five, or maybe nine to six, right, or maybe a home office nowadays, right, right, I don't like, I mean, uh, working on shape, okay, so very different, and then at the same time, okay, if you look at, I mean, the, uh, the portals, okay, I believe, okay, our industry, okay, uh, our service on our portals mainly is uh, uh, intangible, 
o k a y intangible uh, that means uh, the gas uh, hotel gas for instance okay, they cannot uh, 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 try or retest I mean our product not until they come to stay okay in a hotel for instance or maybe not until they come to a restaurant okay to taste I mean the steak right so this is intangible okay our service okay our product is intangible right and this is uh, our uh, product so uh, as uh, potential uh, workers okay I believe okay, we have to understand all this uh, we need to ask okay, ourselves okay whether or not okay, we like I mean uh, 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 the industry okay whether we have the passion okay, to serve people because as I mentioned before at the very beginning our industry is a service industry and also it's a people industry right you need to meet with people you need to communicate with people you need to talk to people okay so some students i don't know okay perhaps okay, they are quite passive not talkative not outgoing so we have to consider our uh, own personality okay whether or not okay, it's suitable uh, to this industry okay i'm sure dr lopez okay, will have more to share about this as well thank you very much dr <laughs> I cannot hear you well, but I believe you you asked me if I want to intervene. So of course I, I would like to 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 align with uh, with uh, Dr. Chan again. It is true that um, at least for EHL, since we we train future leaders, we we train future business women and business men. In addition to what uh, Dr. Chan uh, shared, for me. It's also key that you you have a passion to lead, to to show the way to other people. Uh, if, for instance, I give you a very very easy example. Imagine you are in a restaurant and you have a you have a very uh, VIP customer, and for some reasons you spill the bottle of wine on his shirt. In, to, to work in this industry, you have to have the passion to try to to try to solve the issue. You you need to have that that willingness to find a solution. If you are the kind of person where you panic and you you don't want to to solve the issue, then I, I think the hospitality industry, the service industry, is a bit complicated. You have to have that passion to solve issues, to serve the people, to make sure that the experience is outstanding because what we do in our industry is to create experience is to create emotions and we, we have to make sure that our students in Hong Kong but also in, in Singapore and Lausanne because we, we we have similarities with Hong Kong we, we, we have to make sure that we we our students are able to create that emotions because it's the only way for the hospitality industry to grow and to and to become um, the industry in the world for me, uh, in the future, and I'm sure, hospitality industry or service industry is the number one industry in the world. And I'm, I hope you had that question for us. I, I hope I will not answer too quickly, but maybe you may ask us, you may ask uh, Dr. Chan and myself, uh, do you think the hospitality industry is the industry that is right for the students or for the kids, for the young generations? Yes, it is. To me, yes, it is. The service industry, the hospitality industry, is the industry of tomorrow. Is the industry that will, to my uh, opinion, will survive any crisis. Can be a financial crisis, can be a sanitary crisis, can be an economic crisis. The hospitality industry, the service industry, will always survive. Of course, we have to transform. Dr. Chan is probably, or Hong Kong is probably not delivering the same topics as 20 years ago. We are not delivering the same topics as 20 years ago, but to me, it's it's a it's an industry that will will survive all possible crises you can uh, you can think of. Yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Lopez. Uh, Amansky. Uh, people may think that now, basically, because of the COVID-19, okay, our industry, hotel industry, tourism industry, uh, have been affected a lot, right? I mean, of uh, uh, I have admitted that okay, for the past two years, okay, our industry uh, has been affected a lot. Okay. But uh, don't forget, okay, before the pandemic, okay, before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, our tourism and 
uh, uh, and travel industries, right? In fact, okay, uh, let's see, okay, let's take I mean, Hong Kong as an example, right? Uh, in terms of the contribution of GDP, right? Uh, it's not bad, okay? Four point something percent, okay? And in fact, okay, our industry, I mean, the tourism industry is uh, one of the four main pillars here in our economy, Hong Kong. So in other words, that means okay, uh, in Hong Kong, we employ okay, a large number of uh, employees okay, in this industry. Okay, I'm sure okay, other countries, okay, Switzerland or maybe other countries, Singapore, right? Uh, uh, if you look at I mean, the statistics, okay, the figures, okay, you can find out okay, how many uh, people okay, working okay, in this industry. All right, so uh, I think, I mean, uh, uh, starting hospitality management, uh, uh, it's good, okay, because it's not just only for our industry, okay, as mentioned by Dr. Lopez before, uh, with, I mean, the knowledge, right, learned from the hospitality management program, okay, other industry, okay, other fields, okay, they also welcome, okay, our graduates. For instance, banking industry, retail, luxury retail, even I mean, the health okay, and wellness industry, okay, they all welcome our uh, graduates here. Okay, so definitely, I believe okay, this is a good choice uh, to uh, the students. Yeah. Uh, thank you once again for that answer. I'm sure it answered a lot of the questions we had in our minds. Um, but now moving on to the next question for uh, both of you. What do you think, what do you cherish most about this industry? What do you think is the most valuable part of this industry? Um, maybe Dr. Lopez could answer this first. Um, Think about think about your personal life. If you think about your memories, what are the best memories you have in mind? I'm pretty sure you were not alone. You were with people. I'm pretty sure it was with someone, or it was because of of an experience. So what what I really like in this industry is this: is the fact that our industry is there to connect people and to to elevate the quality of the experience we can live together. Because I'm convinced if you have an experience with two people, three people, or four people, or five, it's better than alone. And this is what our industry brings. This is why I love so much our industry. It's really because I, I have the impression that when we connect people, we elevate the quality of what we can offer. And yeah, I, I would say that it's really connecting people, human-centric, uh, creating emotions. This is what I love from the industry. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a very simple, right? Uh, even though I always say that, okay, our industry is a service industry. But for me, okay, uh, I think okay, uh, uh, when joining, I mean, uh, this uh, hospitality industry or the tourism industry, okay, we will have a chance okay, to show our care to people. Okay, caring, okay, to show care to people. And through this, okay, I'm sure, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the satisfaction, okay, if you can help right, people during the stay in your hotel, for instance, okay, I'm sure okay, you will have that kind of satisfaction there. Okay, and that, uh, in the past, okay, kept motivating me uh, uh, to work okay, in the industry. Okay, to be honest, okay, uh, before teaching, okay, I used to be in the industry for over 10 years. <laughs> I used to be a hotel manager before. <laughs> A long time ago, yeah. And if I may add on, on uh, Dr. Chan answer, uh, why do sure. we love so much? Because I'm sure Dr. Chan would say the same. Why do we love so much the hospitality industry? Well, guys, give me another industry where you can end up in so many different jobs. Hmm. It's, no, you don't have. The only industry or the only type of education where you can end up in so many different industries is hospitality industry. Hmm. So it's also diversity, and we, we, we all love, as consumers, as producers, we all love diversity. And uh, the hospitality industry offers that diversity. Hmm. And at the same time, yeah, sure. And at the same time, okay, uh, being uh, 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 employed okay, in this industry, uh, I believe okay, people will have a chance okay, to meet okay, with uh, different people from different countries. Every day, even though, okay, if you have a chance okay, to work in the front office, for instance, the front desk, okay, to check in the guests, right, to check out the guests, right? But every day, okay, you may 
encounter something new, very different. Okay, because yeah. your customer they are different, right? Uh, so uh, I think this is very exciting, right? <laughs> Every day when you on stage, they, you may have something new to handle, right? That is very interesting indeed. So yeah. let's move on to the next question. Sure. Um, are there are there any practical experience required to enter the industry? Like what subjects would have would help in the CV or general uh, or in general what would boost a CV aiming for the hospitality industry? Uh, maybe we can have Dr. Uh, Chan start first. Oh, okay. Uh, you mean before entering the industry, yes. right? Uh, what kind of work experience can we should have? Of course, okay, uh, if you have, I mean, uh, some uh, work experience, okay, uh, let's say, okay, I just only take a hotel, okay, because this is about the hospitality, right? I think a hotel, as example, uh, it's good, I mean, to have, I mean, those work experience, okay, in food and beverage operations, right, in uh, rooms, okay, operations, right, because uh, uh, I think uh, being a fresh grad, okay, fresh graduate, Right, uh, uh, during the first or maybe second year, right after the graduation, uh, many of them they will have a chance okay, to work uh, at those the uh, entry level position. Okay, for instance, they could be uh, the uh, front office agent. Right, they need to deal with people. They need to check in uh, the guests. Okay, for instance, right. So with this kind of experience, okay, definitely, okay, it's a very good, right, very good. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the employer. I mean, uh, the employers. Uh, they they like it. They, they like I mean our students okay, with I mean uh, the uh, the work experience and that's the reason behind why okay, for all our students here uh, before their graduation they must to complete I mean the work integrated education here okay 960 hours or even or maybe okay, if you like a six month okay work integrated education okay and through this placement okay they will have a chance okay, to work in different departments right uh, of hotel uh, fund office uh, fund and beverage or even some part of the house departments, like I mean the uh, the human resources department, okay, purchasing, right, uh, engineering department, they wish, they also have a chance, okay, to explore, okay, those operations. I think I mean this is uh, very important, okay, for the students to have, right. So if I were you, okay, if you have the interest, okay, to join this industry or maybe to pick, I mean the course, okay, to study, uh, why not, okay, during the summertime, okay, when you need to select a summer job. Perhaps they can try uh, the summer jobs okay, offered by the hotel, but or maybe offered by other tourism and uh, events okay, organization okay, to get some experience. I think, I mean, this is good, okay, not just only for uh, the company, not just only for your potential employers, it's also good for the students. Okay, because through this uh, part time experience, right, students, okay, you have a chance okay, to understand yourself better. Okay, you can understand more about your own career interests, right? Then definitely it helps, right? You, okay, when you need to select, I mean, uh, a degree to study or a degree, uh, select a job okay, to, 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 to work for, all right? This is what I feel. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, would you like to add anything about, uh, about that, Dr. Lopez? Um, I, I don't know if your question was uh, to enter the industry or to enter one of our schools. If it's one of our schools, of course, we have, uh, at least for EHL, we have a preparatory year, so if you have no experience, it's fine. If you have experience, you can find the, the, the prerequisites to skip the first year. And if your question was related to entering the industry without going to a hospitality school, I would say you you will increase the probability to get a job if you have experience uh, with soft skills. So anything that is showing the future employer that you have good soft skills is good for the hospitality industry. For instance, if you if you only worked uh, back office uh, doing some uh, manufacturing uh, stuff, we are not sure if you are if you are fit for the hospitality industry. However, if you have experience. Uh, serving people uh, front desk or, or anything related to, to to serving people, then you are showing that you have already soft skills. And soft skills are, are important in our industry. Mm -hmm. Can I add something? 
for the application or for our course, okay, there's no need for our undergraduate student okay, to have I mean, uh, the work experience. All right, okay. So I just want to uh, clarify this. Uh, okay, so very insightful answers once again. Uh, now, so we've talked about um, the meaningful experiences in the industry. We've talked about the various job opportunities, whether you're a good fit for the hospitality industry. But now let's talk about career development. So let's say you are already in the hospitality industry. So as an undergraduate, what can you expect to earn? And like how easy it is to climb the corporate ladder as an undergraduate in hospitality? Um, it, it really depends on the, on the school, honestly. Uh, our, our goal at EHL, as I said, is to educate businesswomen and businessmen, which means that after the bachelor, you can already target uh, managerial positions, which is not the case of all schools. Some schools are more vocational, and after the school, you can only target entry-level jobs. It really depends on the school. So, but the, the, it, of course, the challenge is not the same. When you join EHL, you have a lot of business classes, so it means you will have a lot of finance classes, you will have a lot of economic classes uh, to make sure that you can you can cope with the, the managing something. Uh, so I would say it really depends on the school and in terms of career development anyway, I will, I will honestly say that the hospitality industry is one of the industries where you can start front desk and a CEO only thanks to experience. I think it's, it's really one industry where uh, you can observe this. Of course, it's not easy. Of course, it's, it doesn't happen every day, but it's possible. You don't need to have a PhD to be a CEO of uh, an hotel company, for instance. You don't need to have a master. You, have to, you need to have the knowledge. So in terms of career development, even if you decide to not go to any hospitality school, which of course we do not recommend, because going to an hospitality school will give you tools, will, will make your progression faster, uh, will, will, uh, will help you in your, in your development, personal development, but also uh, intellectual development. Mm -hmm. But if you decide to not go to school, still, I think you have a nice opportunity to carry for career development. Yeah, so I totally, yeah, totally agree, right? Because I think sometimes uh, people think that uh, when working in our industry, tourism, hospital industry, okay, having work experience okay, is good enough. They think, they think, right? Because it's all about experience, right? But uh, I think to be a professional uh, hotelier, right, for instance, uh, I think sometimes okay, you need to combine uh, your work experience and your educational knowledge of management. Okay, why I say so? Because uh when you are in the lower position lower level position i think okay fine experience k perhaps k is good enough right but when moving into upper management position right you know that the manager okay will lead those uh, management knowledge right to manage okay, the hotel business for instance right they need to know for instance how to develop i mean a short term a long term uh, business strategies Right, so that's why they have to study and learn something about the strategic management. Right, do you agree? And so uh, that's why I say that, all right, uh, 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 apart from, I mean, the work experience, uh, 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 manager, okay, that's, okay, they need, I mean, those knowledge they learn from uh, either an undergraduate degree program or even a postgrad okay, a degree program, okay, to keep updating themselves. And uh, about, I mean, the career path, okay, as mentioned uh, before, uh, I think uh, for the graduate, uh, again, I just want to take a hotel management, okay, uh, uh, this discipline, okay, as example. Uh, after graduation, I believe uh, uh, those graduates, okay, they will have I mean, many different uh, career, uh, career opportunities, right? For instance, uh, the management trainees, uh, human resources assistant, uh, sales coordinator, a fund office agent, uh, food, food and beverage okay, uh, agent, okay, something like this. Okay. I think I mean all these okay, they are uh, uh, those common positions, right? Uh, hotels, uh, I mean the employers, okay, normally offer, right? Uh, but 
uh, this, okay, definitely this is a very good, okay, for those uh, gra uh, fresh graduate, right? But after some years of experience and, uh, you know, depending on, I mean, the program, okay, from which, okay, uh, the students, okay, uh, graduate, uh, I think after some years of uh, experience, okay, working, okay, in hotel, okay, on the other two, some organizations, uh, the graduates, okay, can, uh, take up okay with the degree okay they can take up on the management uh, positions all right either in hotel to some event right uh, 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 i think it's quite fast okay in terms of i mean the career path okay because they have uh, that kind of knowledge i mean the management knowledge right they can they can combine i mean the work experience all right and the knowledge okay, that they've learned came okay, from the program Right, but one thing I would like to emphasize, okay, because especially in our industry, uh, we don't okay, always use a strict night career ladders. Okay, because uh, uh, let's say, okay, if you really want to be uh, one day, okay, a general manager, okay, to be promoted as a general manager, okay, the number one of a hotel, for instance, right, you need the experience, okay, in several areas. Okay, before becoming a general manager, right, right, or be, before uh, you become uh, uh, become a uh, uh, director of human resources, director of marketing, okay, you need uh, different experience, okay, in different areas, right, the hotel, okay, and this is what I would like to emphasize. So uh, I think uh, for the fresh graduate, right, uh, uh, I always encourage them, okay, to try different positions, okay. Uh, in the hotel, I mean, in other true summit organization, other true summit event organizations, right? And because okay, those experience okay, that they uh, they learn, okay, uh, definitely okay, is a very very useful okay, for their career okay, development, right? Uh, so this is something I would like to emphasize. Thank you for your answer, doctors. So out of curiosity, when we're talking about career, can we make um, a lot of money in this industry? <laughs> <laughs> Some students might be curious about it. <laughs> uh, you want you want me to answer you first? Go ahead, sir. Uh, I, my my answer is very simple. Good enough. <laughs> Good enough, right? Uh, and also while working in the hotel, right? Uh, you got free meals, right? Breakfast, lunch, gay dinner. It's all free, right? For employee, and that's good. Okay, sometimes get quality of food, right? It's very good. Uh, uh, to be honest, okay, in the hotel industry, uh, the salary salary okay would not be very high because okay, this is a people industry. Okay, don't forget, okay, when running a hotel, uh, your owner okay they need to spend a lot okay to recruit staff okay employee okay. Uh, if I'm correct, okay, the labor cost okay, can be up to thirty percent. Or maybe more than thirty percent. Okay, so it's very high, right? So uh, you don't expect okay or oh, very high salary, okay? But as I mentioned before, okay, the salary is good enough. Okay, we can survive, right? And it's not bad. Okay, when compared with other uh, many okay industry, it's not bad, right? So this is what I can say. And again, it all depends. Uh, uh, it all depends okay, on the types. The class of the company, right? That uh, uh, you're working for, right? The salary offered by the uh, luxury hotel, five star hotel, or even six star hotel could be very different from a budget hotel, right? So it all depends. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. It's really depending on the on the position on the on the level. Of course, mm -hmm. if you work at front desk, you will not be a millionaire. That's for mm -hmm. sure. However, mm -hmm. if you if you go to good schools, hospitality schools that target uh, managerial positions, uh, honestly, I have met many CEOs or many managers or GMs of hotels that earn much more money than me. So yeah. everything is possible. Everything is possible. Yeah, everything is possible. I, I just want to raise one question. Okay, uh, Vivian and uh, Rico, uh, I don't know. Okay, whether you can answer this or not. Okay, all right. In a hotel, we have a general manager, number one of the hotel, right? And uh, and in a hotel, okay, it's a very common to have a, a, a head chef, 
ex executive chef, okay, in charge of a different restaurant, Chinese restaurant here in Hong Kong, for instance. Can you guess, okay, which one in terms of salary, which one will be higher, general manager or the head chef, executive chef? Um, I could be wrong, but I, I think it's the general manager. I believe, okay, most of you, okay, or the majority of the participants here, right, you may say, that, oh, should be the general manager, right? Yes, I agree. But this is real. I would like to share with you, all right, in Hong Kong, uh, 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 one chef, okay, the Chinese okay, chef, okay, in charge of Chinese restaurant, the salary is higher than general manager. Why? The reasons behind is the owner of this hotel property, okay, he likes, I mean, this chef. The court food, right, all this is very good. So it all depends, right? In general, of course, okay, general manager, the salary should be higher than chef. So everything can happen, as mentioned by Dr. Lopez. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you okay. the, Thank you for the brilliant answers. So now, <laughs> so now Rico, can you, do you know more about the hospitality industry? Uh, yeah, most definitely. I never expected I would talk about hospitality with two doctors in one room. Uh, so it was very insightful, and I think we tackled a lot of misconceptions, and I really understand like the hospitality industry more, and I'm even considering it now for my undergraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. that marks the end of this year's EduFair. Uh, it was a huge opportunity to learn and hear from Dr. Lopez and Dr. Chan. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to have such a fruitful discussion and thank you for sparing time for BBS. So thank you everyone for coming and we hope that this EduFair was as insightful for you as it was for us. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Yuen. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you guys.